I want to call the meeting of the uh, City Council Finance um, Budget Hearing for Wednesday, June 3rd, 2015 to order. Thank you, Councilors, for, uh, for being here and those that are uh, here tonight as our guest and uh, we'll be uh, speaking with it at a, at a very short time. Just a couple of quick things just for housekeeping matters while it's on my mind. Uh, Monday evening, Councilors, we're going to have a special Council meeting this, this coming Monday evening, June 8th. 2015 here at 7 p.m. and it's going to be in regards to items that came out of the ordinance committee so that we can move them forward and then we can act on them at our regular council meeting which would be June 22nd 2015 so again Monday evening 7 p.m. we're having a special council meeting so that we can act on those items that are coming out of the city ordinance uh, meeting and also councilors um, as I spoke with some of you last evening even when I came into the hall uh, this evening um, we're going to hear from the rest of our departments uh, this evening and then we'll conclude and I think um, as I spoke to you again uh, briefly last night uh, and again today I, I will um, have on the agenda for our finance meeting on June 15th at our 7 p.m. meeting we will have uh, the budget so that again we can do our deliberation I think that's the right and proper way of doing it I think we need to rush into what we want to do um, this evening but it'll give us a chance and all you councils a chance to to digest and what's been said by department heads and even when the public hearing was held um, it's a lean tight budget but there may be some areas that we may be looking at it as well so um, we're not concluded yet but we will um, take that up at that night and then we'll move it forward to our June 22nd full council meeting and we'll have a budget by the end of um, end of the fiscal year and of course uh, when we have our finance meeting we'll have the revolving accounts that particular night but that's routine we have them every year to uh, to move them forward um, as well so um, with that being uh, with that being said um, I think we're probably ready to uh, ready to begin so our first um, first customer is Madam Clerk City Clerk Anthony Zioli good evening councilors good evening mr. Good clerk evening, how are you I'm doing well Pleasure to see you. <laughs> Great to see you. You look all so different this side of the bench. <laughs> and you as well. You do too. <laughs> I'm not used to looking at your face to face. <laughs> I bet you wish you were back up there looking at our backs. Eh? There you go. <laughs> the clerk's budget is a level funded budget. I'm sure you have your budget books in front of you. Uh, there's not a heck of a lot I can, can say other than what you have there on your sheet. It's a level funded budget. Is that that's simple no changes council sullivan chairman thank you yes. um, mr clerk i just want to thank you publicly and your staff for helping us on a regular basis it really it, it makes a difference so thank you tony thank, thank you you, thank you mr. chairman I appreciate you're welcome that. councilor any other questions for uh our clerk in regards to the uh, city clerk's office see you none we'll move to the next item madam clerk city council anthony zioli clerk councilors we have the same situation here on your budget there are absolutely no changes other than those that were necessary through contract agreement and as they say it's a level funded budget thank you mr clerk any question councilors seeing none then we're all we're all set with you mr clerk okay thank ladies, you gentlemen thank you appreciate you you can stay around if you want <laughs> <laughs> next item madam clerk Election Commission, John McGarry, Executive Director. Good evening, uh, Mr. McGarry, Good former e City Council of Ward 3. It's a pleasure to see you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Councilors, and, and ladies. This is, uh, if you look, you'll notice there is an increase in both the polls account and the uh, election census. That's because I have three elections in this upcoming fiscal year. March is the uh, presidential primary. Good. Councils, any questions uh, for Mr. McGeary? I do, Mr. Chairman. Council Sullivan. Gary, good evening. Um, absolutely fine with your budget. Just had a question, John. I asked you this last year as well uh, during the budget. Relative to, uh, getting people to work at the polls that uh, speak more than one language. How, how is that going? I know we were, last year we have talked about potentially looking outside of the city of Brockton for some assistance. I've um, worked uh, out an arrangement. I've had a great cooperation from um, Brockton High School, the administration, and uh, one of the uh, department heads up there mm. working with me, and I've gotten 
had a number of senior students who were at the last two elections that are part of the medical transcription program uh, at the high school. They are bilingual. They speak either um, the largest percentage of them are either uh, Haitian or Cape Verdean. So they've been a great help. And we have uh, picked up through word of mouth several more uh, of our linguistic minority members to work the polls. We're, we're getting there. It's slow and steady, but we are getting there. Okay. Okay. That's good to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Any other questions for Mr. McGeary? Seeing none? I lost. That's unusual. I know it is. Oh, oh. We're all set, Mr. McGeary. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilors. Appreciate it. Thank you. Madam Clerk? Retirement con con um, contribuity. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, William Farmer, Chairman. Contributory. Hi, I'm Hal Hanna, Executive Director of the uh, City of Brockton Retirement System. Uh, Chairman Farmer could not be here this evening. Um, you should have before you the uh, required annual appropriation for 2016, which is prepared by PERAC, which is the Public Employee Retirement Administration Commission. It's our regulatory authority, and it's the result of their uh, actuary uh, making a, uh, determining the costs of the system on an ongoing basis on a 20-year schedule. Uh, the total uh, appropriation for uh, fiscal year 2016 is $19,289,967. Uh, the city of Brockton bears the brunt of that. There are some three other smaller units, which is BRA, BAT, and BHA, uh, that pay lesser amounts depending on the, si the size, but certainly the city of Brockton bears the brunt of that 19 million. Thank you. Councils, any, uh, any questions? Seeing none, I guess we're, uh, I guess we're all set. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Madam Clerk, the next item. <coughs> License Commission, Henry Tatalia. Good evening, Council. How are you? Chairman Tagler has asked me to present the budget to you. Um, he's here to answer questions, and I can answer any questions regarding the budget. Okay. Um, it's level funded. As you know, it's a one-person office. Um, our total budget is 88000 We bring in approximately $320,000 in revenue each year. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions for, uh, for Bonnie in regards to the license commission or anything? Uh, the chairman is here. Seeing none, I believe we're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Madam Clerk? Weights and measures. Mark Coyne, sealer. Hey, Mark, how are you? Good. Good evening, counselors. How are you? Very good. Um, I'd just like to we appreciate the fact that we're level funded for this year. Appreciate that from the mayor. And um, I'll take any questions that anybody might have. Okay. Anyone have any questions uh, for Mark Coin from Weights and Measures? Good. Seeing none? Okay. You're all set. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. Thank Appreciate you. it very much. Hey, hey. Madam Clerk. Information Technology Center, William Santos, Acting Director. Good evening, Councillors. Good evening. I don't have any statement. If you have any questions on my budget, I'd be happy to answer. Councilor DiNapoli and thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening. <coughs> just just a, an overall question about uh, the, uh, the the website and, and how it works. Uh, I, I know that you uh, when when there are problems, you do update us, which I, I appreciate the information when when the system goes down. Uh, some of the changes uh, in the city's website do not have the proper people in the proper departments. Are you aware of that? Uh, some we're aware of. We're, that is reported uh, by boards and commissions or departments. Well, you, so, still, you still have uh, Linda Belzotti as mayor in certain pages. I was I don't unaware know if you're of that. aware of that no, or not. I was but, unaware of that. But if you scan through, you'll, you'll find that. Okay. That's, you know. Yeah. I just just wanted to let you know. 
Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome, Council Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. On that same note, Bill, um, the council the other day, be, you know, getting a little old and stuff, so I forgot what committees I was assigned to. So I went to the website to to check out the assignment, and that too is reflecting the assignments from last year. And another thing is, um, I know some time ago we we used to have the agenda on of the council agendas on the website but for some odd reason that hasn't been there for quite some time now so okay. well uh, we post everything that is sent to us so uh, we'll we'll try to reach out and uh, solicit that information now when you say you you post everything that it gets yeah. sent to you what, from the from the from the mayor's office or from the city itself I mean, from the overall city itself. From uh, any any meeting that takes place that gets posted, if it gets uh, sent to the clerk's office, is supposed to also be sent to the IT department. That's a city ordinance. And if it isn't sent to us, then we're not aware of it. Are there any plans to post, for instance, the budgets and some of these other things on the city's website? Uh, prior to council approval? So oh, once it gets approved. Oh, yeah. No, it's it's posted every year yeah because if you look at especially the especially the council uh, page it's actually lacking some serious update or information on it so if you could just kind of okay. check that out it would be greatly appreciated thank you mr. Santos thank you mr. Chen. thank you or council council Sullivan thank you uh, good evening mr. Santos how are you good evening mr. Santos, when, I, when I looked at the uh, the budget I'm gonna ask the same question I've asked a lot of department heads when I looked at uh, 2016, your department request relative to full-time uh, salary was 623,000. Um, the mayor came back with an increase of that of 115,000 to 738. Right. Can you explain to us what, what the justification of that increase is? Yes, uh, there are two uh, proposed positions for public safety for to be shared between police and fire. Um, public safety has been lacking advancement in technology for some time and uh, and now uh, we've we've been doing an awful lot with them over the last couple of years and they need uh, they need some dedication to the attention of their their growth in technology okay my last question is uh, unfortunately in this day and age uh, with public safety and threats at schools and public places is there a uh, is there, and I just went through a training with the state police uh, at the state house the other day, um, is, is there a concept in place here in the city of Brockton relative to a, uh, uh, like, like a, a general notice, uh, a warning notice uh, that would go out through the buildings, through the technology department? To uh, announce problems within yeah. a building? Yeah, yep. Uh, well, the, the school department has some system in place. The city does not have... No, yeah, I was talking about the city, the city okay. side. Okay, yeah, we've spoken to the school about sharing a channel of their system, and that has been okayed. We just need to develop it. And, and, and what would be the turnaround on that? Because it's pretty vital. Well, I, I don't know, because I honestly haven't uh, looked at what it will take to, to build that out. So I would say I can get back to you in a you know short period of time if you with could. an answer. Yeah, yeah that'd be sure. great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Any other questions, uh, Council? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bill, uh, you have an open uh, funded position for 11 months for uh, around $67,000. Are you moving towards filling that? Yes, sir. That that's exactly what I was speaking about. There's uh, there's a technician position and a slightly higher level position for public safety. That would be to advance the, the public safety initiative and in technology. Um, in prior years, they've had some police officers working within the department, uh, working then through us and with us to advance the technology, but uh, that police officer has moved on and uh, the technology position should be within the IT department and that would allow one more officer on the street. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Any other questions? Uh, Just a follow up, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Mr. Councilor. Santos, I think you do a great job. My question is that I think one of my colleagues asked the same last year with your title, acting director. When is the acting gonna be struck? How does that, how does that work? Will you just be a, a regular director instead of the acting? 
I don't know that there's ever been uh, any move forward on that. That's been yes. uh, 25 years. Uh, this was the um, data processing department back in the early 70s, and it evolved into the IT department, but the position titles have not changed. Um, so, you know, I think that has to go before council to negotiate, you know, uh, probably, you know, salary that would be acceptable. So it, I, I think that might be one of the main reasons. It just hasn't moved forward. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Any other questions uh, for Mr. Santos? Seeing none, I believe we're, uh, we're all set. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Madam Clerk. Procurement, Michael Morris, CPO. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Morris. How are you? I'm um, pretty good yourself. Good, thank you. Any comment? Or? Um, the procurement budget uh, is pretty much the same as it's been in previous years, very small and level funded, except for this upcoming fiscal year, the funding for the senior clerk position has been cut. So with, with that, I'll take any questions. Questions for uh, Mr. Morris, Council Sullivan. Uh, I don't have a question. I have a, a really a statement. I, I really think it's uh, asinine to cut a clerk's position. You're the only person in procurement. Procurement's one of the most important positions, in my humble opinion, in the whole city. I mean, it's vital. Uh, so I know you've been working for many, many years here, Mike. You've done a great job. But to not have the assistance that you need is mind-blowing. I just want to go on record saying that. It makes no sense to me personally. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Councilor DiNapoli. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mr. Morris. Good How evening. And I, I feel the same. When you're out sick, who takes your job? Uh, right now, it's the senior clerk. No, but, okay, the senior clerk, the position has been cut, correct? As of July 1st? July 1st, yes, correct. So after July 1st, you're on vacation. The door get locked? No one works in your office? That's what you're telling us, correct? Yeah, I'm, I guess so, yes. Uh, it is my understanding that the unions um, have an impact bargaining session scheduled in the next couple of weeks to discuss the matter, so hopefully something might be able to be worked out. I think it doesn't make any sense. I think it's stupid, but that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Okay. Councilors, any other questions? Council Cruz. <coughs> Thanks, uh, and again, I agree, you do a great job, Mike. So the impact bargaining, what they'll, I assume what you're hoping to do is have somebody share part of your, but the union has to negotiate that? Being a union issue, um, I'm not really privy to the details, but I assume that's what it's about. I mean, obviously you can't have no help, so obviously, that yeah. must be what the plan is, uh, but it has to be bargained? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Any other questions for uh, Mr. Morris? Councilors? Seeing none. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Emergency Management, Stephen Hook, Director. <coughs> Good evening, Mr. Chairman and Councilors. Good evening. Mr. Hook, how are you? Great, thank you. Great. I just have a short statement. Uh, the Emergency Management Agency is a part time agency charged with ensuring the city is prepared to withstand, respond to, and recover from all types of emergencies and disasters at a moment's notice. Over the past four months, the city has experienced two state of emergencies, a federal disaster declaration, and a major federal disaster declaration. I was appointed to this position a year ago, and I inherited aging equipment. For example, one of the vehicles re we rely on to move equipment and personnel is a uh, 2003 Ford Crown Victoria, former, former police cruiser with over 180,000 <coughs> miles on it. This year, it has spent more time out of service than in service. In December, we moved the Emergency Operations Center into the War Memorial Building. And less than a month later, the city experienced the worst winter on record. During that time, department heads involved with storm-related activities conducted several meetings at the EOC, and decisions relative to public safety were made collectively. The new EOC provides a great meeting place. However, it lacks technology necessary to provide city officials with situational awareness and proper communication to federal, state, and local agencies. 
My FY16 budget will allow BEMA to, to maintain the level of service we provide today and slowly correct gaps that have been identified. I appreciate your consideration and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Councilor DiNapoli. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Hook. How are you tonight? Great, Councilor. Listen, you've, you've done a fantastic job in the short period of time that you've been there. I have to give you kudos. I have a question. Sure. The other night, Larry Rowley says that the water department is going to receive a bill for some of the water that was distributed uh, through you and who else was distributing the water at the middle schools. Yes. Do you know anything about that? Yes, I do. Okay. Give us the short version. Sure. So the short version is we had uh, 7,000 cases of water distributed, uh, 2,300 cases we had to pay for. Uh, through the, the staff in my office, we were able to get 4,700 cases donated, which is uh, really a miracle, to be honest with you. Okay. Now, in my understanding, when I received the message, that water was going to be distributed from the middle schools through your organization. Mm -hmm. It came out of the mayor's office. Is yeah. that correct? Well, I don't know which uh, notification you received, Councillor. The, the mayor came from uh, Bob Buckley. Okay. That's the message I got on my phone. The okay. water would be distributed through the mayor's office. Now, is it distributed? Did you get the water or did the office of the mayor get the, get the water? No, emergency management ordered the water. You ordered the water? Yes. Okay. Now, the water that the city has to pay for, mm -hmm. okay, where, is, where are we going to fund that? Where is that coming out of? Uh, Larry Rowley is going to fund it out of one of his accounts. And how much are we talking? About $15,000. Because my, my original thought was all the water was <laughs> donated. No, so here's the situation, and I'll be perfectly honest with you. At, at some point last Wednesday, we had to make a decision. When do we move water into the city? We have, to, we have an obligation to city residents to provide water. A lot of residents were turning on their, their faucets and nothing was coming out. Uh, the Brockton Hospital had no water. Uh, I was very concerned about that. The elderly high-rises had no water. Um, <clears throat> so Commissioner Rowley and myself spoke a number of times and I, you know, we went back and forth on how long the repair was going to take. And we didn't have a great time frame on when uh, things were going to be corrected. So about 1.30, I pulled the trigger on ordering water. Now the state, through MEMA, has caches of water uh, located at different spots. That's the water that has to be purchased. We ordered that water because it can get here quickly. The donated water. During the morning, the people in my office, the staff in my office, the volunteers basically, were, were working the donations. And uh, the problem with the donations is a lot of the donations have to be picked up. They have to get prior approval. Nobody, and I, nobody really wants to donate to the city of Brockton. They think Brockton has a lot of money. They can pay for the water. Why are we donating? They'll donate to Red Cross Salvation Army, but Typically, they don't donate to um, a city or a municipality. So my concern at 1.30 last Wednesday was we have a lot of people in the city who don't have water, don't have drinking water. So I want to get as much water into the city, bottled water, drinking water that we can um, in short order. So, so, you, so you made the decision to get the water? Yes. <coughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. You're Chairman. Welcome. Thank you, Council. Council Cruz. Thank you. Uh, actually, I just wanted to say, your volunteers and, and your group, uh, we told Mr. Raleigh last night, what a great job everybody did. You've, uh, the, the person whose place you took did a great job for the city of Brockton, but you've probably had more in the last six months than we've had to do through Beamer in, uh, in six years. I mean, we had many bad winter storms and all when, when Beamer was active, but this February and, and last week have been above and beyond, and I was up giving out some of the water at West Junior High, and there were half a dozen volunteers up there. I know all the other junior highs, excuse me, middle schools, sorry about that, uh, <laughs> um, had the same thing. So it's just, again, I think it was a phenomenal response by the city, by every department, and I want to thank you for, for 
how your your office did in the uh, in the emergency, and again the DPW also. Thank you, Councilor. Definitely a team effort. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Um, uh, Mr. Hook, thank you, too, for your, your work. And um, so very impressed with the coordination that I witnessed um, as a city councilor and, and was able to provide updates to residents because of the work of the mayor's office in, in your office and others. Um, so I do have a question about uh, an article I read in The Globe a couple of weeks ago where the Boston mayor has convened um, surrounding uh, leaders from surrounding towns to put together a working group around climate change and its impact on specifically snow and flooding in their cities and how to better prepare for those, to budget for those. Um, and I sent that article to our DPW commissioner and others, hoping that we could join that working group. Um, and I was informed by our DPW commissioner, um, I, I think I understand this correctly, that we're interested in actually creating a regional working group with surrounding towns. So I wanted to get an update on what that looks like and what your involvement is in that. So Commissioner Raleigh and I have spoken about this a couple of times. Um, <clears throat> those initiatives usually come down through the state through MEMA. They set up the working group. So I have a call, an email actually, into MEMA waiting for some information on those. So typically what happens at the state level, they push it through to MEMA. MEMA pushes, pushes it down to the cities and towns. So um, I don't have a lot of answers for you unfortunately, but there is some talk about it and uh, I'm waiting to hear back from Mima. Okay, were you able to access, did you read the article yourself or no? I did not, no. I, maybe I should forward it to you. My impression is it's an initiative driven by the mayor and not by the state, though okay. I can't imagine a state is not involved. Um, but this is a concern I had several years ago, wondering, uh, it was during a budget hearing, so we've been budgeting for a certain anticipated level of snow each year uh, and it's I think we all agree it's incrementally getting worse and more costly, and yet we're still budgeting for an older model. And so it just seems wise to kind of think through uh, the impacts you know, on, on the uh, physical you know, environment of the city. So well, I would love to, get, love to get an update on you on what that looks like in the coming days, and I'll track down the article and send it to you. Okay. Thank Great. You. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Bonds. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and forgive my tardiness, please. Um, Mr. Hook, I, I just want to echo my colleagues in thanking you and, and the good job that you did. Like you said, the month after you'd moved, uh, you know, we got hit with some crises, as my, uh, my brother, Councilor Stewart, calls um, our recent events. But I do want to just ask for some clarification. On Monday, the mayor brought his budget forward, and there was a line item in there for a stipend for Fred Fontaine mm -hmm. um, as, like, some kind of emergency somebody somebody. How does... How does that work in your office, and, and I guess why is it not in your budget, or just kind of, can we talk about that for a second? Well, I, I, uh, or w w what are his hours, I guess, or something? Is that, a, is that appropriate to ask? I, I, I believe it would be. I, okay. You, you're trying to determine, you know. What so the relationship right. with yeah, that. So the way that works, Counselor, is um, Mr. Fontaine is available to me and to the agency at any time that we need him. If we need him to go to uh, meetings, classes, um, uh, anytime we activate the emergency operations center, he's there. Anytime we need to push out information to um, uh, foreign languages, uh, for foreign language radio stations, uh, stuff like that, he is made available to me. Uh, he doesn't work specific hours in my office, but he is, I mean, you know, <clears throat> the people that work in my office, these part-time employees, work about two hours a day. That's what, they, that's what they're, um, they're paid to do. But in, in reality, you know, during the snowstorms, we were there three, four, five days, you know, almost straight. So um, it varies. You know, some days were there two hours, some days were there ten hours. Uh, during the water emergency last Wednesday, we were there for 19 hours. Um, and, and so he doesn't have set hours, but he does his hours, I guess. Is. And originally, that money, was, was it in your budget last year? It was in my budget last year. Okay. But there was some question about paying him from two different budgets. Okay, so it was moved to deliber deliberately allow him to get paid for two jobs on the city budget as a whole. 
the mayor thought it was best that he move that money to the mayor's office so he could pay him out of one budget. Okay, and now there's another gentleman, the deputy director. Yes. He's receiving that same amount that's in the stipend. Is his a stipend as well, or is that a set part-time or? Part he's, he's a, he's a, he's a part-time employee. He works office hours, mm -hmm. uh, 10 to noon, but again, um, he's available when there's emergency. So his hours are flexible as well. Okay. And have you ever needed to use Mr. Fontaine during City Hall 830 to 430 hours? Or is it always after hours and night emergencies? Um, no, we've used them uh, during the week, uh, especially to attend classes and attend conferences and, and trainings and stuff like that. Okay. So he's getting his stipend and regular pay for working, but he's working for you. Or, I guess the BEMA. He's, he's working for the mayor, and he's available to me. Okay. And um, just one thing, too, the, the water, just going back to the water. So, I guess elementary math would put it that the cases that the city now has to pay for mm -hmm. were at, like, 6 bucks, six fifty a case. Um, that, that's, what, that's what being charged? There's no other? About 650 a case plus delivery. So that includes delivery. Plus delivery, okay. okay. So not plus, includes delivery. Includes delivery, I see, okay. All right, um, okay, thank you. That's it for now, thank oh, you. Sir, Chairman. Chairman. Yes, okay. thank you. Council Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hook. Hi, uh, Council. Again, uh, I think the folks in here have said enough uh, in terms of the work that you and your organization does here in the city. But I, I have um, basically a question and a comment in the same lines that Council Barnes brought up in terms of um, the discussion that we had here with the mayor on Monday. <clears throat> um, and you basically said that you use uh, Mr. Fontaine uh, whenever you need him to go out to the the non-English speaking communities to basically decipher any sort of information that you want to decipher. That's, that's basically what you said, right? Correct, or anything else that I need them for. Not specifically for that function, but. But my question is, um, the Cape Verdean community accounts for almost um, a third of the kids in the public school system, and it's safe to say that it's probably somewhere near a quarter of the population of Rockton. Mm -hmm. But yet, Mr. Fontaine is Haitian speaking. So, your, and I'm going to say your organization because it's you and the mayor together working towards accomplishing this particular goal. How do you account for passing valuable information or emergency information to the largest non-English speaking community that, you, that you, we have here in this city when you don't have a single person in that department or anywhere in the emergency uh, system that actually speaks that language? Well, there is somebody in the mayor's office that, that speaks Haitian and um, somebody else in the mayor's office and a number of our volunteers, our CERT people, do speak Haitian as well as um, other languages. No, I'm, I'm specifically talking about I understand that you have Haitian, and, and Fred speaks Haitian Creole, and I'm, not, and I'm not questioning his ability or his lack of ability. All I'm saying is that if I had one position to fill for a non-English speaking person, logic says that I should satisfy the greater need of the community, which right now lies with the Cape Verdean community, not necessarily with the Haitian community. If you have two or three bodies, I can understand that. But if you have one position to fill, shouldn't you fill the position where you can get the bigger bang for your buck versus the other way? I, 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 you're going to have to ask the mayor that question, to Mr. Uh, Councilor, because uh, he was the one who brought f Fred forward um, to the Emergency Management Agency. And, and Fred was working at the Emergency Management Agency before I even took this position. Uh, he was the coordinator there, so. No, but I, I'm looking at your budget. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you had a communications director position mm -hmm. that was technically eliminated for your from your budget. Yep. 
To me, that position could have been advertised and we could have found perhaps a better serving. When I'm saying a better serving, I'm saying in terms of numbers person to fill that position and somehow that was moved around to satisfy whatever needs were satisfied but to me it makes no sense and I remember when I was with the uh, with the Harrington administration uh, once upon a time ago I was presented the uh, the emergency plans for the city and I had a real problem with that because the plan was done in English in English only and if we're trying to evacuate people from this city and the evacuation notices or forms are done in English and English only, how do we evacuate the population of Brockton? So now I'm coming back with the same issue, saying that yes, you've taken care of uh, the English-speaking community, you've taken care of the Haitian-speaking community, but your largest non-English-speaking community, we have absolutely no way to kind of, from the emergency management side of things, I'm not talking about somebody in, the, in this office or that, that office, I'm talking about somebody in a position that could actually come out and address the community in that specific language. I see that as a major problem in this community. Uh, again, you know, we, do, we could rely on some SERP people, some SERP volunteers that could uh, fill those positions to relay those inf that information to the, the, uh, the Haitian speaking public. You keep coming back I, with the Haitian, I'm saying Cape Verdean. Okay, Cape Verdean. <clears throat> and, and again, the folks from the school system are here and they can attest to this. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not talking about a handful of people. You're talking possibly a quarter of your population. To me, that's an urgent and emerging situation that I think we should look into addressing. You know, if it's through grants, it's through borrowing money from one department or another, but they have the ability to actually have somebody staffed, whether part-time or whatever p position that we're talking about, to basically handle that population that we are right now not able to handle. I'm all in favor of that. If you want to uh, send some more funding my way to staff a position like that, it can only help the city. But it, see, my, my problem is that I, I don't see the administration or BEMA seeing that as a serious issue. And to me- I, I would disagree with the council because, uh, you know, when we had, during the snowstorms, when we were sending messages out, we sent them in multiple, multiple languages. When we, when we went to um, get signs made for the sh shelter, the, the emergency shelter, they were printed in four different languages. Well, let me so we are thinking about it. Let me tell you something, because I, I basically, one, I work with the Cape Verdean Association, the, the association that actually works for or to represent the, some of the needs of the Cape Verdean community. Two, I also do a cable television program mm -hmm. through Brockton Community Cable Access. This is the I, I show. And not once, not once. I have been contacted either through the association or through cable to share that information with the community. So the fact that I hear that you guys are doing all these wonderful things and translating all this information, somehow, if it's not coming to me as, a, as, as possibly the only multilingual speaking counselor on this, on this body, how do, you, how do you think that the average Joe in the community is getting that information? Well, I will tell you, counselor, that I personally met with um, the Haitian community partners um, board, I guess, <coughs> down on Belmont Street. They had a meeting a few months ago, and I asked to attend it to build relationships with, with that group. So in the event of emergency, we could tap some of those people to get the messages up. I am, I, I am, glad, I am glad that you've met with the Haitians, but I... I, I don't know if, you're, if you know this or not, but I'm actually Cape Verdean. Okay. And I'm talking about that Cape Verdean Association has been here since 1977. And I'm saying that there's got to be a better way to communicate the needs of this community through the proper channels so we can all work together and help out. That's what I'm saying. Well, why don't you and I talk offline, Councilor, we and we can, uh, maybe you can direct me to some people um, that could help us out with that. We will. I just wanted to make sure that it stayed on record. Mm -hmm. You know, that to me is a concern that, you know, we've had 
the worst winter on record. We've had uh, a water issue in the community here. And frankly, a good portion of the citizens of Brockton's taxpayers were kept out of that loop. And that's why I'm bringing that up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. I, I, I gave you a little bit of lee, leeway there. I, I really did. That's because I got a but, cold. And, I, and that's okay. But I think <laughs> if you want to get to your, your end result, I think you probably need to file a resolve and bring the mayor in and ask him some of the same questions that you asked Mr. Hook, because I don't want to, no pun intended, we're not trying to put you on the hook. But, oh, understood. Uh, in any case, I mean, it did sound like that, and he's only doing what he's told to oh, do. Oh, I understand that, but um, Mr. Okay. Chairman, I was also saying that because he's responsible for BEMA and I wanted to make sure that once we have an emergency situation in the city, right. that that information is shared. And, and, and you're absolutely correct, that it's shared out to every every piece. I agree with you there, yes. Someone else had a, I see, Council Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hook, good evening. Uh, good evening. Thanks. Thank you for uh, what you do for Brockton, specifically uh, last week and the snows this winter. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just to kind of circle back on a couple of things that were discussed tonight. Uh, I was actually kind of uh, surprised when Larry explained to us that the city has to pay for some of that water. Um, based upon the uh, extraordinary circumstances, is there anything within the guidelines of the Commonwealth where the city could petition for a waiver to pay that back? Like a forgiveness? Because I can't imagine the history of Brockton, we've, we've, we've had to do that too often, the magnitude of the amount of water. I don't think in the history of Brockton we've ever had to hand out water um, like that. I don't think we've ever had that situation before. Uh, we can try. I can reach out to MEMA, but it's probably unlikely, to be perfectly honest. I mean, you know, th the reality of it is is we, we had 7,000 cases of water delivered to the sea. We gave out most of those cases. We have two or three pallets of cases left. Um, Two-thirds of that water was donated. One-third we have to pay for. Yeah, and that's, that's why I have a problem. And I think everybody in this room probably has a problem, including yourself. Um, but if you could look into that uh, and potentially <coughs> reach out to the state delegation, Brockton's fortunate. We, of course, we have a great senator and three reps, so yep. that might be beneficial. Um, one question that I've been asked recently, Steve, uh, is relative to the SUV that you drive, the vehicle that you drive. If you could just explain to us um, the parameters of that and uh, uh, is, it, is it strictly for business? Do you drive at home at night? I've gotten a couple calls recently about that. I thought this would be an appropriate time, Mr. Chairman. You mean the BEMA vehicle? <clears throat> That's fine. Yeah, the BEMA vehicle. The one um, just drove by me. Yeah, that one. Yeah. No, no, the, the one I have out here tonight is mine okay. uh, for my full-time job. Um, but the BEMA vehicle is assigned to deputy director. Um, depending on if I'm around or not, if I'm not around, he will take the vehicle home. Um, just so he can go to a potential uh, issue, you know, if he has to go open up a shelter or go to the EOC to open up the EOC, he has a vehicle that he can um, do that with. Um, if I'm around, typically he doesn't, I mean, both vehicles are sitting down at the War Memorial right now tonight. Um, nobody has them. One's out of service um, and the Explorer is sitting down there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council. Any other questions, uh, Councilor Azak? Good evening, Mr. Hook. Good evening. Thank you again for your service. Um, Thank you, Councilor. I just have a quick question. You, you stated that some of the water cases were donated. Can I ask who did donate water to the city? Sure. Um, Stop and Shop was a great community partner. They donated almost 4,000 cases of water. Um, Costco's, BJ's, and Home Depot made up the rest. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Do you know which stop and shop? Well, h here's the thing with the donated water and the reason that we, we pulled the trigger on the purchased water was when you, when you call stop and shop to get water donated, there's a lot of red tape that has, you have to go through. It's not come down to the store and uh, pick up the water. It doesn't work that way. Um, they don't typically have that much water at a store and they don't, have the means to get it. So they have a warehouse down in Fairhaven, I believe, is where this water came from. So they had to get somebody with a truck. They had to go down to Fairhaven, pick up the water, um, and deliver it. That takes time. Um, and it was, it was 
they weren't even sure they could do it at, at 1.30. We weren't even sure we were going to get any of that donated water. So that's why we went with the MEMA water that we had to pay for. Uh, the other issue with the donated water, logistically, once a, a big tractor trailer shows up, we need to get that water off the truck. They don't bring any means to get that water off the truck. So we have to uh, uh, look for a uh, forklift, or uh, some type of uh, piece of equipment to unload that water. Typically, we'd go to the DPW. Obviously, DPW is very busy that day. Uh, through our contacts, we were able <coughs> to uh, obtain a forklift from the VA hospital. So they provided a forklift and a forklift operator who met us at the four sites and unloaded that water for us. So the MEMA water comes, they deliver it, they unload it, it's a lot cleaner. I know that I can have water in the city immediately. Where the donated water is a little bit up in the air, uh, it doesn't come as quick. It's not as easy to get. So is that why it was more expensive or than I believe what uh, my colleague Councilor Bond said is approximately six dollars a case. Is that well, the cases that they sent were 36 bottle cases. Um, I think if you go to the store and buy it, it's probably a little more expensive than six dollars. Sure. Plus, there's a uh, there's a delivery charge there. There is okay. What about did we get charged at all by the VA hospital for helping no. us? No. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor. Councilor Moore, here. Did you? Yeah, yeah, just, hi Steve, again, you guys did a great job. Thank you, Council. I just want to go back on um, Council Rodriguez, because I kind of find it hard to believe. It, when, during the crises, uh, the emergencies, the snowstorms, let's go back to that, let's go to the water. <coughs> and I don't know what he was trying to say exactly, but uh, is, is it the Haitian community was notified and the Cape Verdean community wasn't notified about this? No, stuff? I think oh, they were both is, notified. Okay, so, so what, how does it work that... I mean, I know you're meeting with the Haitians and you're going to meet with the Moses and his group, the Cape Verdean group, but I mean, what is it the communication that wasn't out there that we're talking about Fred Fontaine's Haitian and he's got a job, but there's nobody in there for Cape Verdean. Are we, we are informing all the Haitian, Cape Verdean, whoever, we are. foreign language speaking uh, citizens, we are informing them of everything available to them, that there's water, that whatever is going on. That community is served and notified by radio, they're going to, are we going to their own radios, Cape Verde and Haitian radio states, these people are being covered, it's not that they're not being told what's going on in, during emergencies. Is this, is this? So the way this works, Councilor, is in the event of emergency in the city, there's a number of ways we push messages out. Uh, you have code red, which is the reverse 911, you have um, the cable television, you have social media, you have, um, the state has what's called Pink 4. They push that out in different languages. Uh, and we also reach out to radio stations, okay? Some of them illegal radio stations in the city. Um, <clears throat> just to get the message out. We have agreements with them that in the event of an emergency, we will send them the message and they will put it out over their radio stations um, in their language. Okay. I just wanted to make sure everybody was being covered, because I, I was sort of getting the idea that they weren't being told. But Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councilor DiNapoli had a follow-up, and, uh, and I'll go to Councilor. You just, you just tickled my feather, Mr. <laughs> coming. You, you reached out to what radio stations in Brockton? We don't have any. Uh, there's a radio station in Randolph that broadcasts into Brockton is one of them. There's a couple. Um, I don't have which, the whole. Which radio stations in Randolph? <laughs> It's I don't have licensed. that information. Okay, I understand that. It's not licensed, and you, I respect you, that. You, However, you, you um, reach I, out to a radio station that's illegal? I do. You know why, Councillor? Because I'm not the FCC, but we need to get the message out. And I don't care by what means that we send the message out. We need to get the message out. Great support, Steve. That's all. All set, Councillor? Councillor? I, I have one follow-up. Uh, Councillor Rodriguez was... <laughs> Another follow-up, but let's not be repetitive, <coughs> Councillors. Councillor Rodriguez. Well, I just wanted to make sure that uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Hook didn't quite understand what I was saying. The Cape Verdean Association of Brockton has been in this city since 1977. It's the only community-based organization that actually has a physical location mm -hmm. in the city. 
not renting space from anybody. Everybody knows that it's located on Montella Street. I'm telling you that that organization was not contacted for any of the storm activities that we've had in the city. And the city councilor who speaks that language was not contacted for the purpose of sharing that information with the, with the communities that I, for which I speak those languages. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So when I hear that the Cape Verdean community was contacted, I don't know who's doing the contacting. The organization that I work with was not contacted. And the counselor who actually speaks that language for that specific community was not contacted. I just wanted to make sure that I clarify that because. So I'll work with you to make sure that we, we improve that in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. <coughs> Councilor Sullivan, you had a yeah. Just one, just one follow up to uh, Councilor Barnes's question about Mr. Fontaine. So that that eleven thousand four seventy four. I just want to make sure I understood what you said, Steve. Mm -hmm. I, I understand what you say. His job scope is relative to your department, but I think Councilor Barnes asked during the workday, um, and City Hall closes at four thirty. He's getting paid out of the mayor's office for his job relative to the forty four thousand, wherever he gets for for that. But there's been some occasions that he will actually work with you during the day? Yes. Okay. It's not right. Okay, thank you. And Councilor Bond, you had a follow-up. I did, yes, and it's actually to, about the notification um, yes. situation. I'm not seeing in the budget where that would be a line item with regard to the, one, the notifications that you say happen, the pink call and the reverse 911. Where does that come from? Who pays for those those calls to the residents or the, the reverse 911 calls um, paid for and done through the sheriff's department? Okay. Plymouth County Sheriff's Department pays for that. Okay. Okay. All right. Good. And ping for is paid through by the state. I got it. Excellent. Okay. So we're not being. No. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank right. you. Mr. Thank you, Council. Councilors, we're all set on this particular item. I think that house is pretty. Thank you, Mr. Hook. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for everything you do. Appreciate it very much. Madam Clerk. Fire, Michael Williams, Chief. Good evening, Chief. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. I know Good you've been waiting for this moment. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you, right? I'm sorry? Yes, you've been waiting for this moment. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Neither do Thank, Thank you to very see much. You. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, Any opening statement? Just that I'd like to thank my staff. Um, <clears throat> having to produce this budget so early in my tenure uh, was uh, challenging to say the least but thanks to Captain Gilpatrick who also was here this evening and my uh, head administrative clerk Suzanne Backoff did a, they both did a wonderful job in supporting me and helping me through the budget process great so thank you great Councillor Cruz we'll go right into questions okay sure right. Councillor Cruz Thanks for being here. Uh, first of all, usually we get about a 15-minute speech t yelling at us for not buying any new fire trucks, but I guess <laughs> you're going to be an easy chief. <laughs> uh, first thing is congratulations on your daughter winning the spelling bee this uh, this past week. Uh, yes. My daughter's a past winner, so I know how nerve-wracking it is. Thank you very much. Um, I haven't had too much of a chance to look through. Do we have any new... Uh, we have three more promotions coming up in the next week or two, don't we? Uh, next couple of weeks? No, Councilor. I, I believe the next promotions will be uh, at the end of July. I have a so, captain and a lieutenant that are retiring, I believe, July 9th and 10th. And actually, that was what I was getting to for questions. Do you know how many people, generally, the police and fire have a pretty good idea of how many they're going to lose in a in year? Do you know how many you have? Seems like right now it's a pretty young group of, of uh, deputies and uh, the captains. Uh, do you, do you know how many think you'll have retiring yes, we, this year? We put 11 positions in the, in the budget for, with, for separation costs. And looking into, speaking with those 11 people, I believe eight are going to be retiring or should be retiring. So there's three that uh, even though we put their separation costs in the budget, we don't believe don't that know. they are going to leave. And will, uh, any talk of replacing them or do we have? Yes. Uh, the mayor has allowed us to put 10 positions in the budget for six months. And the reason being is the hiring process takes some time. So it wouldn't be till probably the end of the year, or not, if not the first of the year, before those positions were actually filled. Really or I filled. should say start and go on the payroll. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you, Council. Councilor Stewart. Thank you, uh, Chief. Uh, good to see you. Good evening. I just had a question about the um, organizational structure of the fire department, uh, that's specifically about the budget. So, and I'm not quite understanding the organizational chart here. So underneath you, there are what looks to be three executives with different titles. I'm just not understanding what, I see operations, and I'm not understanding uh, what the executive officer is, and I'm assuming the headquarters administer, what, what are the, can you just explain that to well, me? Well, the executive officer is Captain Gilpatrick. Okay, and the headquarters administration is my, my head administrative clerk, hmm. and, um, Michelle's title? Principal clerk, I'm sorry. <coughs> um, Deputy Chief of Operations um, is actually, he, technically, his, his, uh, he's in charge of training. Okay. No, and then, so the executive officer role is what exactly? He is my administrative head. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think I understand the the deputy chiefs around. Okay, so so the deputy chief of operations is head of training. Correct. Okay, um, and then I'm seeing here there's a training division, <coughs> but I'm not understanding the flow of the chart here. So okay, maybe you can just walk me through it because I don't quite understand how it's laid out here. Sure, I'll, I'm obviously at the top. <laughs> um, the deputy chief of operations is my training deputy, but I also have a deputy in charge of fire alarm, and that basically is down here. It says fire alarm signal division, mm -hmm. uh, and under him is, well, it's, it says deputy chief, but that's his position. Um, I have four deputy chiefs, one in charge of each group. Those are the suppression deputy chiefs. Um, my maintenance division, I have an apparatus repairman and a master mechanic. So for example, the fire suppression deputy chief, it looks like that person is above the training division, the chief training officer, but that's not the case then, right? Correct, yeah, it's just the chart, you know, you could have put that deputy chief up on the top of that chart, but. So, do, so the chiefs are responsible for each of the roles that are underneath each box, or, or no? Because the, because the line comes from the executive officer, so that's why I'm just not certain who supervises what here. Do you understand my question or no? No, not particularly. <coughs> the okay, so if you have, so I'm looking at the, um, so from you is the executive officer, mm -hmm. and then that line goes right down to what looks to be the fire alarm signal division, the apparatus maintenance division, the training division, and the fire prevention bureau, giving me the impression that the executive officer is in charge of those no. work groups, but that's not the no, case. No, that's not the case. Would it be possible to, to then just, I'm just curious if I can get an updated version of this chart sure. that actually shows sure, take who's in control of what. Absolutely. And, okay, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, sure. Chief. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Councilor. Councilor Bonds. Um, actually, I'm, I'm all set. I'm sorry. You are all set? Yes, okay. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Denapoli. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Chief. Good evening, Council. And uh, Councilor Cruz already said it wanted. It was a nice picture of you and your daughter in the paper. Thank you very much. Congratulations, and congratulations again. Thank you. Uh, I have a question on your your overtime budget uh, for 2015 is, is a lot lower than what it is for this year, so 2016. Mm -hmm. It's been cut a lot. Is that because of uh, new, new, the new firefighters was, that are on the job? I'm sorry, two, 2015 was lower? No, 2015 was a lot higher, right? And, right. and it's a lot lower if for 2016. Is that because of the new firefighters that we have, that, that you don't need that overtime? No, not necessarily that we don't need it. Um, I think there's, there's two overtime budgets or two accounts. Um, one is the manpower, and then, uh, Captain, what, what's the? This is fire service overtime. All the other services, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that, those two amounts is what, uh, what we put in. 308, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. The, the other one is your uh, fire goods and supplies was cut also. Correct. Uh, by $12,000. 
other than that, the, uh, the money for the fire truck has been eliminated. We saw that. But maybe we'll have a little bit of luck when Mr. Conan writes our check in, in, uh, in uh, the hoping. end of August for, for that. We're hoping. But uh, th those are the only two questions I had, Chief. And uh, thank you very Great. much. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Thank Chief. you, Councilor. Any other uh, questions for um, Chief Williams? Mr. Chairman, oh. actually, sorry, yeah, I do have a follow-up that I have had a couple of people ask. Can you just explain a little bit how, for the public, because I did have two people ask me about this, during the water crisis, obviously there was no pressure, there was in some parts of the city no water. Can you just give very briefly how you, what you and your department had to do to be prepared for... Uh, I, I reached out to my fellow chiefs um, through the Mass Chiefs Association. Um, got some advice from them, and I secured a tanker from the town of Rainham, a uh, tanker supplying about 2,000 gallons of water that in case we did have a fire, we would be able to pump from the tanker into our engines. We also beefed up our engine companies within the city. Um, that day, most of them had started the day with three men. When the crisis happened, we bumped them up to four men on each one and manned a sixth engine also, just in case we needed it, because those engines do carry 750 gallons of water. So basically we had to borrow some. So my point is for some of the people who still think we uh, don't need to have a, a rate increase and fix those pipes, you had 2,000 gallons come in and we have about 750 gallons in. But if there was a major fire, we would have been in some real trouble, I believe. Is that true? We could have been, yeah. The town of Whitman also had secured a tanker, and I, I dealt with the, or spoke with the Whitman fire chief several times that day, and we were kind of watching each other's back. If he yeah. had anything, I was going to send that Rainham tanker over to Whitman, and if we had anything, he was going to do the same for Brockton. Yeah, and I know the fire service in general does that, you know, a lot of mutual aid, but uh, a, a, major, a major fire would have been an absolute disaster, it could, it couldn't it have been? Could have been, correct. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. We're all set, uh, Councilors. Thank you, Thank Chief. you. Thank It'll you. get a little easier. <laughs> Good job. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Mr. Chairman. Councilor Sells. I was wondering if we could take law out of order because I think school department's going to be a little lengthy and I don't think Attorney Nezzarella. We can. Uh, you, we, would you object to that, anybody? I, I, does anyone object to that, that we take law out of order and then we'll hear school department? Yes. Law and order? Is that what law and order, yeah. Law and order. Yeah. There you go. These lawyers stick together. Before nice job, do, Sully. Before we do, Councilors. <laughs> I, um, Madam Clerk, just read, um, read the law, but I just have a comment. Uh, law, Philip Nezrella, solicitor. Just before we do, Mr. Condon just wants to speak to us um, just briefly in regards to um, the law budget. So yeah, this is a just a technical clarification. The law department budget was prepared and uh, the budget was submitted. And subsequent to that, the council adopted a uh, ordinance that affects the law department. So the funding that's in the budget does not reflect the structure that's been approved by the council for the law department it's about seventy thousand dollars short of what it would need to be and we'll have to find the money to take care of that as we move into the next fiscal year problem was timing the law department budget was as i said was submitted before that ordinance was adopted basically it has to do with the uh, additional full-time position of a senior assistant city clerk right. it's about about seventy thousand uh, dollars my suggestion would be had the budget come through my office a couple of weeks later and we weren't in that time crunch, I'd have probably suggested to the mayor that you reduce the outside council budget because the intent of that position is to is to reduce those costs. Okay. okay, thank you. So everybody understands that. Okay, great. Okay. Um, that being said, Mr. Nazarello, how are you? Yes, good, thank you. And I appreciate that gesture. I can return my sleeping blanket now. <laughs> <clears throat> any, uh, any comment or you just want to take a... Uh, no, I think uh, it's relatively straightforward, especially in light of the the comments by the uh, the CFO. Yeah, holding it. Uh, I think uh, it's moving in the right, right direction. Uh, I'd like to extend my appreciation for those members of the council as well who uh, saw fit to allow the modification of the law department, which is, in my opinion, uh, way overdue for many, many years. And I think uh, we are moving it in the direction will be a very firm, strong, uh, stabilized department uh, providing the legal services that it is intended to do. So I just wanted to re-express my appreciation for the council's assistance on that. Very good. Thank you. Uh, questions, councilors? Uh, you don't have any questions for Mr. Nazarella? You better run now. <laughs> <laughs> just, keep on, just keep going. That's it. I guess we're all set. All right. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> and the last one. School Department, Kathleen Smith, Superintendent. What was this like? Schools. What was this book? Good evening, Madam Superintendent. How are you? Good evening, Council President <coughs> and Councilors. Um, see you. It's always a pleasure to come before you. Uh, I want to take a moment to, to thank all of you this year. Uh, one of the requests I made exactly a year ago was to have an opportunity to come before you, not just during budget time talking money, but also talk about some of the challenges we face. Uh, many of you joined us this past fall with facilities. You certainly joined us during our legislative dinner that we had in November. We continue to present before you on a number of occasions, so I want to thank you for the continued support. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to, to see you and have you here with us uh, as well. So uh, Tonight, because on. as you said, this is quite a lengthy budget, uh, your school department being probably the biggest budget in the city. Um, I have put before you um, a, a PowerPoint uh, to follow along. Uh, I would like to make a couple of statements a as we go along. Uh, first of all, I can't say that this uh, budget picture is a positive one for the Brockton Public Schools. We continue to have layoffs, reductions in services, uh, cuts in supplies, materials, programming. I'm not here tonight to finger point. This truly is a community problem and it absolutely will require the whole community. Our city council, our school committee that has done a fabulous job working with this budget the past couple of years, uh, mayor, the parents, uh, business owners, our community leaders, everyone needs to come together and I hope when I finish tonight, you know, we'll understand that that is the only way that we're going to find a solution to this. I do want to thank also the chief financial officer, uh, Jay Condon, who worked with me the past couple of years as a new superintendent, uh, working to, to take a look at what we call Schedule 19, which is ever-changing, uh, understanding, of course, Chapter 70 and how the schools are supported. And uh, this past year, again, we worked very, very closely uh, with the mayor uh, and the chief financial officer uh, to come to a budget that, again, is a difficult budget, but one that we will certainly in the Brockton Public Schools, as we always do, step to the plate. You expect educational excellence. I said that to you a year ago. And we have truly weathered a string of, again, devastating budget cuts that have led to, I call it, and you'll hear me talk tonight, about erosion of core programs that our families need, want, and deserve. This year, uh, our school committee recommended budget, and I will let you know that the recommended budget from the superintendent for net school spending was close to $176 million. And that is what I truly feel we need as an urban system to support our children academically, socially, emotionally, and the wraparound services that our students need. Our school committee recognizing that put together a budget of $172.9 million to again send a message that in order to educate close to 18,000 students in our ever-growing district, that is the budget that we felt would work. If you look at level services, and if I look back a year ago, the budget that was passed was $160 million. It was $6.6 .6 million below the level services of the previous year. So in order to have that budget, which is not a budget I would have wanted this year, level services would have been $166.9 million. The mayor, uh, chief financial officer, our school committee, again, worked very closely to put together the current appropriation of $165 million. There's a $1.9 million shortfall and an overall shortfall looking at the recommended budget from the school committee of close to $7.9 million. In our net school spending, and again, I'm looking at a growing district. For FY16, we requested 8.7 million. The current appropriation is 7.6 million, and that's 1.1 million shortfall. So when you look at this, when we talk about this being another tough budget year, the cost of snow, snow removal the past year, very little growth in Chapter 70 and local receipts. Uh, again, I can't say it enough that we continue to work together, our principals, our executive team, our teachers and our staff, you know, to make this happen. One of the things we've also done this past year is I'm, I'm a little disappointed. Uh, Aldo Petronio, our uh, 
chief business officer, and I attended throughout the state what they call Chapter 70 hearings. We were very hopeful that as they started to look at this Chapter 70 funding of schools, that they would look at things that truly matter in an urban district. And I do feel like there is an assault on urban districts. I understand, and there's been talk for a long time about the suburban districts wanting a piece of the pie. It doesn't matter if it's a bigger piece of the Chapter 70 pie. It doesn't matter if it's grants that were at once uh, entitlement grants for the city of Brockton. Now they've become competitive grants. I was very hopeful that they would look at things such as the October 1st date is when we report our student enrollment. We had made a suggestion, and, and I said again that Aldo Petronio went to every one of those hearings across the state. Didn't matter if it was in Western Mass, he and I were down the Cape together. We made sure that Brockton voices were heard as far as what we needed to support our school children. We were hoping they'd be a February 1st date, because in between October 1st and February 1st, we have growth sometimes of over two and 300 youngsters that we continue to have to educate with that October 1st date for almost 18 months before we actually see that funding. We talk about our English language learners. Our English language learners are different than English language learners that come from other communities. Communities where maybe the parents are doctors coming here for the first time, very well educated. Many of our children, their parents are coming here, uh, are not speaking English. They're, for the first time, assimilating into our culture. It requires very different support. We wanted them to look at poverty level. So these were things, there has not been a report out on Chapter 70. We're starting to hear bits and pieces, and I'll keep you uh, informed of certainly what is happening in that realm. Um, what I would like, and you'll hear me talk about towards the end of this presentation, and uh, I don't think any one of you will be surprised, I know I talked about it last fall, that it is time for Brockton again to be a leader. And what I mean by that is I do think when we talk about equity, I think it's time to look at a lawsuit. You last looked at this with the McDuffie case, which really brought on our ed reform. And of course, for many years, Chapter 70 worked and made a difference for our Brockton kids. And it's time again to work with possibly other urban districts to start to, to push back and to talk about the things that we deal with that are not dealt with in every district. And you've heard me say before, we have a homeless population of over 500 youngsters. And I don't want them anyplace else because we do an excellent job supporting and educating these students. But when you take on students like this, there should be some recognition in gateway cities of how we continue to support these youngsters. In talking about non-net school spending, you see that we requested the 8.7 million and that is based on wanting five additional buses. Uh, vans are uh, due to, again, our ever-growing population. Our mandated McKinney-Vento homeless transportation has been creeping up by the hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. Uh, the mayor has put forward as much as he can at this time. My deputy superintendent, Thomas, is looking right now to reconfigure bus routes, trying to get by without these vehicles. I was pleased to see, and I'm sure many of you saw the state auditor, Suzanne Bump, a classmate of mine, as a matter of fact, uh, put forward a report talking about the McKinney-Vento mandated support uh, and was hoping to at least give back to communities like Brockton, which are shouldering close to $900,000 is what we're probably looking at this past year and possibly giving 50% of that money to the districts. As you can see, that, that's a difficult amount for, for us to assume. Uh, last year, we spent $739,000 on homeless transportation. Right now, I believe we're at 722,000 with just about a month, actually a little bit less than a month to go in school, but we are truly anticipating about a $900,000 price tag. So what are our growing needs? We talked about back in 2010, you see in front of you, I have close to, uh, well, 15,828 students reported October 1st. On, Oct uh, on October 1st, 2014, 17,186. 206 new students between October 2nd and June 1st that we will not see funding for 18 months from the date that that was actually reported. We have seen growth uh, over the last couple of years of 400 plus. I will tell you it does appear that growth is slowing down in the city as far as students coming to our school district. Right now we have a lot of moving parts. So when you look at the budget and you look at, and, and tonight I'm sure one of the things you'll say to me is, well, your budget is $5 million more than it was the previous year. 
but I want you to look at some of uh, the funds that we're dealing with. Uh, so ordinary maintenance, an additional 800,000, and I know people are also seeing increases in their own electricity, utilities, materials, supplies, everything has an increased price tag. Collective bargaining with all units. We do have the Brockton. When I came on as superintendent, I think I told you last year I hit the jackpot. We had seven unions that were in negotiations last year. Our teachers union, we have spent over a year in interest-based bargaining. I was very pleased with the process. I feel a fair and equitable contract is out there. Tomorrow evening, our teachers, uh, our BEA uh, unit has an opportunity. Hopefully, we'll ratify that contract. It is a four-year contract. And again, as I said, I feel it is fair and equitable. And again, we're in negotiations and finishing up with all of our unions. Step raises, 3.5 million built in. Personnel, compliance mandates, such as a student moves into the district, has an IEP, an educational plan, needs a one-on-one -on -one aid, a para, an MTA to support their educational plan, built in $300,000. Increases to our tuitioning out students over $300,000. When I talk about the eroding of support for urban districts, and this is a federal mandate, your E-rate. So again, everybody wants a piece of that pie. We agree that everybody should have a piece of the E-rate pie. What we don't agree with is going forward with the same amount of money. I would have liked to have seen federally an increase in supporting other districts, not taking away from, again, a lot of the urban districts that has supported our infrastructure for certainly many years. Um, also, uh, I will tell you, and I'm sure every group coming before you, if we want to remain competitive. Right now, we have an educator evaluation system. We're bringing on a system called Baseline Edge to support the new evaluation of our educators. We're bringing on a software called Talent Ed to make sure that, again, we are able to hire uh, induction, making sure all the paperwork is done correctly. So these are things that I do not think can wait. We need to move forward with our school district so we are able to compete with other districts to get the best and brightest teachers here in the Brockton Public Schools. Um, again, talking about Chapter 70 reimbursement. The uh, governor's budget does not maintain level funding to school districts, and one of the things, if you look back, and I've done a synopsis of three years. So FY14, we had an 11 million additional uh, funding in our budget based on 447 additional students with an inflation factor of 1.55. Last year, almost the same number of students, 438, 8.5 million, with an inflation factor of 0 0.86. That does not make sense. This year, FY16, 6.8 million for an increase of 225 students with an inflation factor of 1.43. Part of that Chapter 70 discussion is looking at some of the increases that we're dealing with across the board with, again, uh, health insurance increases. And I know they're talking about tying in a separate inflation factor to deal with the increases in health insurance and another uh, factor under Chapter 70 formula to look at the increase in support based on uh, increased student enrollment. Uh, again, I've talked about, I feel the governor's budget doesn't adequately provide for the urban districts, our most challenging students with poverty, English language learners, homeless, bilingual students, traumatized children. And uh, again, I, I will continue to say this, and I will say this publicly, I do feel that this is an assault on uh, urban education and our students. So what is the impact on students and schools this year? We have the highest enrollment we've had in over 20 years, and yet we continue to have increased class sizes. I think many of you know that in this last budget, we had originally uh, we had uh, sent out what they call pink slips, a reduction in force of 176. Unfortunately, we have a date in a contract of May 15th when we have to notify teachers if we do not intend to bring them back the next year. So based on that, we had continued to work on the budget. I, I worked <coughs> with the school committee. Um, we still have another meeting coming up on June 9th. We continue to look at efficiencies in the district, looking at ways that we can consolidate pre-buying, trying to get to the end of the year to see if there's any additional money in our budget. 
I am pleased to tell you that we've identified the possibility of bringing back 48 of those positions. That still leaves me, right presently, 125 teachers will remain uh, out uh, being a reduced, reduction in force. And at this point here, I cannot tell you that there is additional money to bring back those teachers. We also laid off 60 plus staff when I talk about administrative assistance, paraprofessionals, monitor teacher assistants that are those very people that support our youngsters to help reduce class size, to work with our special needs youngsters, to provide all of those additional supports for our large school system. I have to tell you that many of the programs that were sacrificed last year still remain unfunded. Some of those are academic support programs, extracurricular activities, reductions to clubs and activities. And when I talk about the assault on uh, urban education, it was, I went to uh, Bridgewater State University back in February, I think it was during Black History Month, and Dana Molafaria had assembled a number of um, legislators uh, to talk about, um, again, the uh, minority community and support. And we had a, a teacher, uh, Amando Vieira, actually attend this over at Bridgewater State University. And I loved his questions, and they were not our state representatives or senators. I'm sorry, I can't remember their names. It was a wonderful event. But I will tell you what Amando Vieira said to them. We recently, over the past couple of years, have had a couple of grant programs called the CELL program and the SEAT program. And these were, although they were grant funded, they provided additional learning time in the summer for our bilingual students. We developed curriculum for our students. They went an additional 20 days. There were extra supports for them. We saw differences in reducing the achievement gap during that time. So isn't this the reason that you keep a grant in an urban district, or any district for that matter? And instead it was cut. What was the reason that it was cut? It was showing and making a difference. And don't forget, you know, the train is running with education. The mandates are great. Educator eval, district determined measures, you know, surveys coming in, change to the common core, trying park in the district. All of these things we are willing to do. Our teachers step to the plate. We continue to try to support our students with less and less funding. Somebody has to be held accountable for that. Brockton hasn't had a budget above level services in over a decade for the school system. This again has led to the erosion of key programs and services, not to mention staffing. That, and again, don't forget all of these things made us a leader in urban education. We need to find a way to continue to reinforce the work that we are doing in the schools. And again, just to talk about some direct services that are still unfunded, over the past two years we've cut technology, 3.2 million. Every year, that becomes one of the things that we can cut. How many more years can we continue to do this to our children? When you're talking about park, when you're talking about making sure that they are ready for college and career, how many more times are we not putting technology into our high school? And yet we continue to defy by not doing this. I can't tell you that we still are not getting all kinds of awards. And that's the determination of your children, your families, your teachers, and your administrative support. Your community school after school programs. I met with about 100 bilingual parents at their PAC meeting the other evening. And one of the things that they wanted and they questioned, what has happened with that ac academic support? I can't help my youngster. I'm having a difficult time. I'm on a waiting list of over 1,200 at the Adult Learning Center trying to learn the English language. I want to support my child. Those were the kinds of programs that made a difference. They asked me why we didn't have programs in every one of our schools for parents to be able to access teaching to learn the English language. These are things that people want and need for their children. And it's very difficult to stand before them and continue to tell them that we're doing the very best that we can, but we continue to cut. School supplies unfunded, 320,000. Parent liaisons. Parent liaisons came in back, I want to say probably around 2001. It was an idea Mary Beth McManus had researched, found a grant, we brought them into the schools. They were part and parcel of the schools. They made sure the parents knew about the upcoming events, made sure there was a welcoming atmosphere to bring our parents into the schools. It was cut last year. I'm not able to bring that back at this time. I had a grant through one of our bilingual grants, Title III, to bring three parent advocates on. They, have, they came on late in the year. We waited to get the funding. 
they've really started to make a difference in our bilingual community, again, finding ways to assimilate them into the culture of the Brockton Public Schools. Right now, I'm waiting to see if there's a grant to continue to fund those positions. Um, School-based curriculum development, $20,000. I put on here the Brockton High School Band Transportation. This was for away games during the football games, cut by $10,000. Seems like small money when you talk about a budget that's over $220,000 when you look at all of the grants and the additional funding we have in our school. I want to bring to your attention because I don't want this to be all doom and gloom. If any of you have been around even the past couple of weeks, we had the band boosters uh, recognition night for our seniors. We have had a wonderful senior prom. We had a recognition last night before our school committee of all of the awards that our students received. Counselor Azak's daughter, I think they walked away with a number of them last night. Congratulations. We defy our demographics in this city. Looking at the number of perfect MCAS scores, eight in English language arts, 20 in math, two in science, and one in Eng one youngster that had both English language arts and math. We were awarded Brockton High School the bronze medal for the fifth time, 315 John and Abigail Adams scholars. Our, our EOS Foundation, Breakfast in the Classroom, I recently went to the State House and Brockton was honored throughout the state because we have made a commitment to feed our children, all of our children, breakfast in the classroom for a short amount of time in the morning. Children are, are ready to learn, eager to learn, less visits to the nurse, no hungry bellies, and again, children are ready to learn and succeed in our schools. Advanced Placement International Baccalaureate Program Class Offerings, Award-Winning Band, Chorus, Fine Arts, Drama, JROTC, 32 Enterprise Globe and Herald, All Scholastic Athletes, a strong, strong partnership with many of our higher education, Bridgewater State University, certainly Massasoit, we're working with um, UMass Boston, uh, UMass Dartmouth, we continue to, do, to grow that. What are our next steps? So we're not just sitting back. We're taking a look at a grants and development office. We continue to write grants. We continue to look for innovation in the district. We're bringing together a development office to start to ask businesses. We're working with the alumni to provide them with space uh, over at uh, our central administration office to make sure that we support giving back to our school district. I presently have a seat on the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. I work with Baywood to make sure that I understand that it isn't just about the schools. We are part of the larger city. And we understand, again, that in order to support our schools, we need to make sure the businesses are welcomed in the city to, to help offset some of these costs. So we certainly have been out there supporting many of the efforts that you're trying to bring forward to support our community. Um, again, I am going to ask you, and, and I hope that you will join me in a couple of things. This summer, I would like to put together a task force. I would like a member of the city council, or two, or three, or however many, working with our school committee, working with our mayor, and starting to take a look at an equity lawsuit. You know, bringing somebody on board to advise us and inviting other urban districts to join us, I do feel that the time is right to, to look at this. I'm going to ask you again about a facility master plan. One of the comments made to me was, well, if we're cutting busing, can we go back to neighborhood schools? We can do a lot of things, but you don't turn around on a dime. You have to have a plan, a facility master plan that not only supports the school, but certainly supports building, and I've said before, it can be a 20-year facility master plan. Let's at least get out there and start planning. And last but not least, I do want to tell you, because I've come before you on a number of occasions, uh, and we have uh, begun our uh, community group, our task force, to work on diversity in our teaching staff. We have a Grow Your Own program. We've probably met about four or five times. This is our Human Resource Office, working with our Grants and Development Office, and we have a number of community partners on board, a number of the higher education groups on board. I just attended a conference uh, down the Cape this week, working with the deans of education at all of our state colleges and universities. And very much that is on uh, their front burner also start to encourage, you know, and this, this is going on certainly throughout the country. But I have to tell you, when I stand here and tell you that we've made some progress, but 173 layoffs, it's all our young teachers. It's all our new teachers. It's exactly that young blood that you want on board that really revitalizes the whole teaching staff. 
So uh, again, I thank you for all the support you have given us. I think we are up for the challenge to, to work together and find ways that we can continue to support our youngsters. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Thank you for the presentation. I do want to take time to acknowledge, I realize uh, there's one uh, school committee member here, Mr. Hennigan from Ward 7 just came in. I appreciate him uh, being here. And I know you have some of your administrators here with you uh, this evening and uh, familiar face, Mr. Aldo Petronio, who used to sit here as well. And I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Jordan, I, I see you looking at me sternly there, so <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> he always has that look. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for being here. We appreciate that. Um, Questions, we're gonna start with uh, Council Monaghan was first. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Smith, and uh, for the great job you guys do with what you have. It's amazing, and still getting all these awards and stuff. And uh, I, still, I see, uh, do you still have a June uh, Saber uh, McGuire? Is she working with you guys these days? Last I looked. <laughs> oh, oh, there she is, that's right. Glad to see you got some Irish, you know. All right. <laughs> well, we don't talk about that. But anyway, I mean, I, I know you did it, last year we talked about it, the way that the, the city is treated, the urban communities are treated. I know you guys came up with a letter last year trying to go after them for that money, that trying to change the date and what have you. Um, I definitely would like to be on that equity uh, lawsuit there. You're definitely 100% right on that because, I mean, we, for what the city does with social services, the, the immigrant community, we, how we treat, you know, what we take into the city and how we... We're, we're picking up the ball for the rest of the state, and they are not doing a thing for us, as far as I can see. And I don't know, as far as our state delegation and our federal delegation, why, if you are involved with them at all in trying to get this, these uh, things resolved, I don't know, have you been involved with, uh, with them I, at all? I speak to them on a, a regular basis. I feel we have strong support from our, our state legislative group. Uh, the last I met with them as a group, I believe, was actually Good Friday morning. And we meet regularly, we talk about bills coming through, they know how I feel certainly about Chapter 70. They were with us uh, every step of the way with many of the things that we dealt with this past year. So, you know, they're, they're how many votes. I, I think the urban districts are, are outnumbered by, again, if you look at the sheer numbers in the State House. Uh, but I know they're certainly representing us the best that they can. And I would include them, obviously, in this discussion also. We'd have to, because, I mean, this is getting to be ridiculous, so we're losing money. We're doing more with less, and it's, it's got to stop, and I agree with you 100%. And, and again, thank you for the great job you doing, and the whole school department does. Thank, thank you, Councilor. Councilor Cruz. Thank you, and I really am just going to echo Councilor Monaghan's comments, which I don't like to do, but uh, <laughs> you and I have had this conversation a half a dozen times. Uh, the, we won this lawsuit, and we, th this city won the lawsuit and changed how kids were educated in this state and the state has turned its back on us, and the courts have turned their back on, backs on us. Um, I, I will ask the president to put me on any task force you're putting on that, but we don't even need to have a big task force. I think it has to be done tomorrow, yep. get this court case reactivated. Uh, I'm not an attorney. Maybe I'll ask Counsel Sullivan, but that court case was still open till not, not too long ago, a few years ago. And, I mean, years ago, and it was kept open by the courts to monitor how the state did. And then it was closed. Obviously, the state needs to be, that case to be open and to be held their feet to the fire because right now the state is breaking the law. The courts have ruled how the schools are supposed to be funded, and the state is breaking the law. I don't think it's going to take a long time to win that lawsuit because it's already been won, and we just need to reactivate it and get the state to do its job and fund the schools the way they're supposed to be funded. We're, we're taking, as Council Monian said, we're taking all the brunt of the, uh, the expensive <laughs> students to, to educate and doing the work of lots of towns in this area and all, all of these urban, uh, excuse me, suburban towns that think they were missing out on, on the boat, we'll say, let's fine, we'll tell you what, we'll, we'll take the same amount of money as you, you take half of these problems that we have to educate these expensive students to educate. And again, we do a better job than they, because they tend to not care about those students, we care about them. And we need the state to have the courts to put the state's feet to the fire and get that court case reactivated tomorrow. <laughs> Is, is my belief, and uh, again, I, I don't think it'll take long for any judge to read what the state has done through these last 10 years and say, you're breaking the law, get back on it. And that's, 
That's my high-handed horse, and I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor Cruz. Councilor Bonds. Uh, yes, I actually have some questions. A, a parent, um, a friend of mine who's a parent of two students here in Brockton, she sent me several, but um, two from her and then a couple from me that I just want to ask. Apparently, there's um, there have been some principal changes or administrative changes at the George School or something, and I was wondering if that had to do with the offering of early retirement, is that working in the budget somehow, or, or how is uh, no, that administered? No, Counselor. One of the things that uh, I'm presently doing, it, it doesn't happen often. We actually had a number of principal openings because we don't lose principals, short of, as you said, retirement. Okay. I'm looking at putting some leadership teams together. Uh, I will tell you, and actually I'm glad you asked that question, because in the past month I have had the commissioner here uh, looking at our, our known school. I've had the associate commissioner here looking at the Raymond School, and one of the things that they're looking at is we do remain a level three. And understand, as your superintendent, I would like us to be a level two, we'll work to be a level one, but we're level three, we're the only urban district that remains level three. And there are times we're hanging by a thread, continuing to do what we need for these students for accountability measures with very little money and decreasing support. So they're coming in saying, how are you doing this? with no intervention from the state at this point. And again, we don't want intervention. We don't mind grants. We don't mind all of the things that we can handle. So when I look at accountability, there are a number of schools that accountability-wise are superintendent priority schools, schools that if I have any extra, whether it's Title I, whether it's putting additional interventionists in the schools to work with some of the neediest students, they're wondering how we're doing this. When they sat and talked to our teachers, it was all about coaching, it was all about curriculum, it was all about, again, materials and supplies to support the students. So when you ask about changes I'm making, I'm putting leadership teams together in my neediest schools for those principals that I think can really move those schools, or leadership teams. So I'm not finished yet. I have had, when I went to the bilingual PAC meeting, actually that was one of the questions that they asked. What I have told those parents, and I also just got an email from Ray uh, Henningsen, our school committee member from Ward 7. Mm -hmm. I will go out and speak to the parents, introduce when I'm finished, the new leadership team. We will talk about some of the changes in the district. And again, we will go out of our way to make sure our parents are comfortable because I think you get used to people. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, these are changes that I need to make at this time. Okay, um, thank you. And um, she also mentioned, too, uh, about the, the age, and, and I don't have a child in the, in the school system, so I'm, I, I'm hoping I can ask this that you'll understand. We apparently have an old formula, an old uh, kind of calculation on students when they can come into, I guess, pre kindergarten or pre-K or, or whatever it is. And it's still... I guess that December, like five by December or four, four by December yeah. situation. Can we move that up so that we may not get that influx of kids that we do Again. late in the year? Excellent question, Councillor Bonds. Again, this is something that the school committee, when I came on as superintendent, it was already something we were dealing with. Okay. So I think what you're talking about is if you look at a number of the surrounding towns, in order to enter kindergarten, you need to be five by, I'm going to say September 1st. Right. It could be August 31st. Right. So our date has been forever, December 31st. Right. One of the things that we have seen is children not really prepared. Remember, we're full day kindergarten, where a number of years ago, you had half day kindergarten. So children would go, those very young children, we call them the Burr babies, September, October, November, December babies. One of the things that as an urban district, if we received money for preschool, and you know that under Governor Deval Patrick, that was certainly you know, one of his major initiatives. Uh, presently, we're not seeing that money coming, because as I stand here, even if that is 400 youngsters, I don't want them not in a school having opportunities. We're talking about district-wide. Do we set aside, and we've done this in a number of our schools, classrooms for those very youngest students where maybe the numbers are a little bit less? We provide supports. If, in fact, we think that they can handle uh, another kindergarten in the school, we'll place them there, and other children might come in regardless of their age. So it's a population we don't want to not have in front of us. I would rather have them there as preschoolers, but we try to adjust our curriculum so that we have them there, they're learning, and we are supporting them at a very early age. Okay, but that, that has a significant impact, though, on the budget. If we were to change it or... Well, we do receive funding for those youngsters. Oh, we do? Yes. Okay, all right, I wasn't sure. 
Um, now, the new growth that you, you speak of, um, and I mean, since I've been here twice, um, is it, I guess, uh, grade-wide, or is it all of these kindergarten students? Are there students coming in mid middle school, high school? Typically, when we've seen growth, I mean, I can certainly look at different grades to show you where kids are coming from. Mm -hmm. But typically, it is at the younger grades. We call it the bubble right now. And I believe it's our grades. I have my deputy superintendent here at three. Great so grade school. three, when you even look back at the Barrett Russell, which all of a sudden in April, we were opening a school that we had had closed for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And by September, we had close to 300 youngsters that we did not have place for. Mm -hmm. And remember, there was a lot of pushback. The families at the Hancock that couldn't get their students in there because the numbers were so large. You know, we, we kind of forced them at that point to go to the Barrett Russell, which has just been an excellent kindergarten center. If you haven't had an opportunity to come and see close to 300 youngsters learning to read, emerging writers, we've been very pleased. But again, that's how we reacted at that point because that was a large bubble, a large influx. Um, I can get those figures to you, but across the district presently from October 2nd to June 1st, we've seen about a growth of 225 students. And most of that would be certainly in our, I think, our K to 8. Okay. And so if, if these kids are coming in, they had to have come from somewhere. So is there a way to maybe not tax where they came from or maybe mm -hmm. uh, put a some kind of lien or, or a... A, a, I don't know, something on where they came from? Well, it would be nice if they changed the date. So we're looking at more a February 1st date. You know, you're looking, in, in other words, one of the things we've seen, and, and I'm not sure if this is a secret, but, you know, there are many, uh, you, we have choice. I, I like choice. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's uh, regional schools, whether it's charter schools, everybody knows the game. And the game is you keep a student until October 1st, and if for some reason it's not a good fit, you wouldn't let them go back on September 30th. There's no way. You know, we see after that October 1st date, a number of students coming back to the Brockton Public Schools. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Except as we said, that 1800 month lag truly hurts us. We're not a wealthy district. Right. So again, this is something that we brought to the table when we talked about chapter 70. I don't think there's any other mechanism for, for funding the, those students or that growth. Okay. And um, with regard to the technology cuts, I guess I just want a little bit of uh, clarification. When you say cuts, does that mean taking out um, like Wi-Fi or apparatus or you're just not upgrading and getting it's, new? It is. It's exactly that. Um, okay. Dean Vigen, our director of technology, comes before us every year. And you all know, you know, you buy a device today, you know, a year from now there's something bigger, better, faster. So we have some devices that should have a lifespan of maybe about five years, and instead we're keeping them eight, nine, and ten years. Okay. Equipment breaking down, not having state-of-the-art equipment. We have visited districts where when you talk about park now, you're talking about one-to-one -one devices, where children have that device in front of them all during the day for teaching. So they're understanding how to perform functions which would help them on their park testing, which now has not been the determination of our state for our high stakes testing. That determination will be made probably sometime late fall. But there are districts out there that those students all have a one-to-one -one device. So we were talking about leasing. We're talking about you know purchasing or making sure, just like your facility master plan, we're trying to make sure we have a plan so that when uh, this tech technology gets older, we have a way of getting rid of it, bringing on new technology into the district. So last year, if you remember when I came before you, uh, our, our budget last year, I think, really did take us by surprise. And again, we were 6.6 .6 million below level services, what it would have been the year before, and everything went. $2 million that we had on the table for technology cut. Mm -hmm. This year, we were a little bit more prepared. And again, we've gone back and forth with, okay, if we can't lease 10,000, 10, because we found a leasing program we thought would work with our students, can we do the leasing pro program and maybe bring on 5,000 devices? So it has just, it's just been out, an outright cut, not allowing us to, to support the technology we need in the district. Okay, and um, coupled with last year's reduction in grant availability, um, I just want to also just ask, are we actively pirating, I guess, you know, private companies. I, mean, I know Boston has the Boston Foundation and, you know, they're very generous. Right. I mean, do, are we doing that? Are we reaching out to the Microsofts and to the, the Apples and all of these things maybe to get 
some of these things that we need? Yeah. I will tell you that we have a number of very talented grant writers. Right. For instance, we wrote a large grant for after-school programs trying to make up some of the differences that I spoke about tonight. And we came very close, but, but we're not a recipient of the grant. In the middle of the year last year, when you talk about cuts, we had 9C cuts. A grant to support our kindergarten was cut by almost $300,000 mid-year. So these are things we have been struggling with. When I talk about all of these things coming to make this a very difficult year, it's not that we're out, not out there right. looking for grant funding. You know, we continue to make sure we're front and center. We were awarded a $75,000 innovation grant for an international <coughs> charter school that I'm very excited about with a dual language program. Right. We're talking about possibility of, of Horace Mann charters in our own district. So, you know, we continue to be out there looking for additional <coughs> funds, ways to support our students. When you talk about the foundations, for some reason, many times we don't qualify for the grants. Okay. I know that Boston has had very good luck with large foundations, but we are trying to go after as many grants as we can. Okay, and one more thing. I didn't see it, um, but the Independence Academy, has that been absorbed by the Brockton School District, or is that yeah, here's, here's what we do with that. If you remember last year, uh, initially we had supported the in, uh, Independence Academy with uh, $50,000. That was in our budget. We were unable to do that last year, but if they take children from the Brockton Public Schools, they get the Chapter 70 Monday money for that youngster. Okay. So if we were to send four youngsters, they get the cost of those youngsters to educate them. Okay. All right, great. Thank you, um, Madam Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council, thank you. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Madam Superintendent. Um, first of all, thank you for coming here, <coughs> as always, and, and giving us the information. Um, and unfortunately, this information, much like last year, is, is, uh, is depressing. It's, uh, it's reality, but we're talking about people's livelihoods, and uh, it's really, it's really going to have a negative, truly negative impact on the kids, and that's what it comes down to. The Brockton schools are really the crown jewel of the city of Brockton. It's, it's why uh, people move here. It's why people stay here. Um, and year to year now, teachers are really living with the uncertainty of what their future is. I mean, these are, are stellar professionals um, that want to educate um, the young here in the city of Brockton. They want to make their roots here in the city of Brockton. But the layoffs are really driving teachers away. And, um, you know, when I, when I looked at these cuts, uh, Kathy, I mean, we're talking about um, English teachers at Brockton High. You know, we're talking about librarians. We're talking about 125 uh, certified teachers. Um, you know, home ec, culinary, um, principals. I mean, we didn't even really talk about Champion Alternative School. Um, when my brother went to Brockton High in the 90s, there was 45 kids in this class. That's going to happen again. And that's, that's a sad reality. Um, you know, I echo the sentiments of, of Mr. Cruz. Um, you know, when you look at the Webby case, Hancock case, McDuffie case, it's all here in Brockton. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Um, Brockton's getting shafted by the state. Transportation reimbursement, we should be getting. We're not. Lottery funds, we're not getting our fair share of that. Um, you know, unfortunately, the reality of the homelessness, it hits home here in the city of Brockton. I didn't know those 500 students. Um, we, we also need to look at um, the school choice program where, where uh, Brockton residents are sending their kids outside of this wonderful public school uh, system. Um, you know, the Paris, uh, it's, that, it's just truly, truly, truly uh, gonna hamper the efforts for years to come. So I applaud you because we do need to work as a collaborative approach. It's not school side, city side, it's, it's one. Um, but again, I, I was extremely, extremely disappointed last year with the negative impacts on the middle schools. Um, you know, and, and again, this year, it's just gonna be a combination of, of more negative things. Now, the good thing is, and the successful thing that you showed us again, is, is that the, the professionals, um, as the saying of Teddy Roosevelt, you do what you can with what you have where you are, and, and that's what you do. Um, but again, you're gonna be seeing administrators who, who haven't been in the classroom going back in the classroom. And, and you know, it's just, it's, it's really a sad commentary. And I, I wish we had a magic wand, but, mm -hmm. but we don't. And, and when we're looking at um, the end of the day, what we're looking at is that teachers, when you, 125, um, you know, that's, that's just, that's a reality that's, I don't know how we're gonna fix it. Well, you know, thank you uh, for saying that. And one thing I will tell you is, we have already had inquiries, and I, I met today with district directors, I met with my academic cohorts, which are my principals that have their own cohorts throughout the city, 
uh, and meet on a regular basis. And every, th this was the conversation today. You know, people handing me the number of students at Brockton High School if we take away the, you know, family and consumer sciences that will, you know, had already put in to take electives and we're scheduling. And this is a division right now that, that we have cut in place of needing core subject teachers at the high school. You know, I, I listen to, you know, how can you cut these young teachers? I'm already getting calls from our SPED director, getting calls from Fall River, getting calls from other districts that are not laying off mm -hmm. teachers and wanting, why do they want our teachers? We do professional development. You know, we make sure that they're supported in the classroom. When I talk to you about instructional resource specialists, reading resource specialists, administrative teams supporting that young teacher that is coming in for the first time dealing with a very, very needy population, traumatized children, our educators, not everybody can teach in an urban district. Tonight I have Dr. Moran here from our Human Resource Office. And again, when we talk about interviewing and making sure that we're recruiting and hiring, we know the kind of teachers that we need to hire. What we don't want is after spending all of this money recruiting, hiring, professional development, mentoring, losing them to other districts. So again, our loss is their gain. It's expensive, number one, and it's, it's a really a... Uh it's a sad, again, a sad commentary. I, I do want to thank you, though, uh, Madam Superintendent, because, again, I, um, you know, a lot of us came on 10 years ago, and, uh, you know, we saw Mr. Beige and Mr. Nimbico and Mr. Dr. Malone, um, and, and I have to say, Kathy, you, you, you speak from the heart, and you give us the information as elected officials we need, and we need to uh, somehow do better. We, we, we owe that to the kids, so thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. You're welcome, Councilor. Councilor Stewart. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Smith. And I'm happy to call you Dr. Smith because uh, the D and JD is, so um, <laughs> I actually um, try not to get too involved in the budget of the school department and because there's an elected body that does, I think, a really good job of uh, looking at the budget. And so many of my questions, actually the few that I have are really focused on just some instructional questions I have and then um, funding for a particular program. Um, but I will add that Brockton is very well respected at the state level, and I often try to get Brockton involved in any work that the state is doing uh, around uh, learning from the field. And uh, so I hope I don't burden the district too often with requests uh, to have no, you. No, no, I hear that you're a big support, and we're thrilled to have you there. And, and, and excited and proud to be representing the city. Um, just a question about instruction. So, uh, an, an ELL student or an L student, an L comes to Brockton uh, who's um, 16 years old, so that kid is in the 10th grade and has to pass the MCAS. Um, does Brockton place that student at the grade appropriate level um, because of social issue, so social dynamics, or does Brockton place that student closer to a level where, where he or she may be better served instructionally? What happens in the district? Well, I mean, depending, they certainly are tested when they come in to see, you know, where they belong. If we're talking, obviously, 16 years old, you're talking the high school. So we certainly have bilingual classes to support that youngster. Uh, again, we provide, or had provided, all kinds of support in the summer, additional programming, because you're right, you know, those students need to pass MCAS in order to receive that high school credential. I, see. Um, I, I have Deputy Superintendent Elizabeth Barry here. Um, I'm not sure if you want to add anything, Liz. <coughs> you may have to come to the microphone because I don't think um, it will project for folks watching at home, too. In instances like that, we most certainly look at age, and we want to um, place students where they would be more comfortable with their peers, but it's then how would we support a student who is 16 years old who may have gaps in learning or, or whatever, whatever they may um, be dealing with. Um, so I think that age is one factor, and then um, assessing the student where he or she is coming in and providing opportunities throughout the day to meet the student's needs. And how successful are we at getting those, those kinds of students over the MCAS bar who are coming to the district, uh, newly, new arrivals who have to take the MCAS that same year or the following year? Um, 
I can't speak about it statistically. Um, I think that we most certainly have some success stories that we could share. Um, I can't really speak to it statistically. I mean, it is most certainly a challenge, um, particularly because sometimes what we're dealing with is students who have that limited or interrupted schooling. Right. Um, and we actually have an advisory committee working on that because when we have kids who are coming to us, um, we, want, we want to make sure that we're not putting them in a situation where they're going to be um, feeling that stigma of being with younger students, but that we're putting them in classrooms where they're feeling that, that, they're, that they're, uh, they're with their peers socially, mm -hmm. but then how do we support those students academically and also non-academically? Okay. Um, so I can't really speak to it statistically. I mean, we could certainly provide that information. I just have more anecdotal kind of information sure. on that. I would love to get just a, a snapshot of the data if you guys okay. could email that and to And just me. so that I can frame it correctly, you're, you're particularly interested in students who are new to us. Correct. Um, coming in at 10th grade or, or prior or, or to or that? Or 9th grade, 9th and 10th grade. And, okay. and, and the percentage of the students who get past, uh, who can pass the MCAS. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. One of the things also, you're talking about students that are overaged, undercredited. We have found many times a student comes to us at a certain age, and we have what originally was called a newcomer's program. It is now Edison Academy in the evening, where it might take them a little longer. The class sizes are a little bit smaller. So we have found a large number of students have gone to Edison Academy and have met with success. It's a program, and it's actually in the budget, uh, money that we support for summer. So they're attending classes in the fall and the spring, and we actually have a summer component. That's great. It's great to hear. And uh, just, again, you guys do an amazing job, and uh, it just becomes more and more evident uh, with my role at the state. Uh, you know, so we've seen some districts with very similar demographics that have been taken over by the state, and the fact that Brockton is a level three district with some level two and one um, you know, um, schools is just incredibly <coughs> impressive, and I don't think the public quite understands the, the level of uh, or the deepness of the, uh, the work that the district has done. Well, well, thank you for saying that. And again, when you hear me talk about, you know, our youngest students coming in kindergarten, first, second grade, you know, our idea is to make sure that they are reading by grade three. So we're not trying to reduce those gaps. So when you hear me talk about reading resource specialists, instructional resource specialists, making sure that we're supporting our teachers, I wish I could tell you that we can maintain class size at a level of the suburban counterparts. I can bet you if I go to Easton, they have probably 18 kids in a first grade classroom, and that's probably high for them. Mm -hmm. You know, we're maintaining, you know, 23, 24, 25. You know, grade five, you have some classes this year that had 29 to 30 students in a class. And this isn't education that all of us knew many years ago. This isn't the type of student. There are many mandates, as you're certainly well aware, Counselor, that, that we continue to, to make sure that we're supporting those youngsters. Right, so my second question is around, is a, a budget question, and I couldn't find it in the budget. And uh, so the Grow Your Own program, uh, what's the funding for that program, and where, where would I find it listed in the budget? Well, there's really, it comes with, again, our human resource executive director, our grants department, you know, people are serving on that, and what we're trying to do is we're including uh, financial mm -hmm. institutions. We're starting to talk about if we are able to grow our own youngsters. A student graduates from high school, has an opportunity to go to college. We will talk about support. I know there's talk out there about the colleges providing help with financial aid. If a student comes to teach in Brockton, a, a grow your own student, then is there a way that we can support them with loan forgiveness, support them with additional funds for master's program? We're not there yet, but that is the talk at the table. Uh, I do have Dr. Moran here, if you'd like to have her talk to you a little bit about, uh, about the Grow Your Own Group. I would like to, and because I'm particularly interested in this program, and I believe in last year, and it could have been either during the budget cycle or at some other point, we also uh, talked a little bit about tapping the Alumni Association, because in addition to the students who are graduating this year, there are thousands of graduates who are out in the world, and how are we pursuing uh, that talent and bringing those students back to uh, the district? Right, as um, Superintendent Smith said, we've been working with um, a group um, with colleges, local businesses, um, people within the district, the grants and development 
department to talk about how we can continue to bring those students back. Thankfully, um, each year we have plenty of people who, students who have graduated from the Brockton Public Schools, who have gone off to become teachers in uh, graduate programs, and have come back to want to teach in Brockton. But what we're looking for is to expand that by having, as Kathy said, um, some type of reimbursement, um, some type of way to, to um, help fund the college education and perhaps even um, in the long term to repay those loans that they'll have when they leave. Um, so we're expanding it. We do have people who come back, but we really want to be able to have another benefit, a financial benefit um, for, those for those students who want to come back and uh, serve the community that they, uh, that they grew up in. And did you guys have targets in place? So are we thinking that uh, you know, next fiscal year we're hoping to have a certain number of students who, are, who have returned in, in five years? I mean, what does it look like? Because it feels a little bit stagnant to me. Mm -hmm. And because I've, I think this has been a conversation before for like maybe three years, and yeah. it, it feels like we're in a place of, of exploration when it feels like we should be executing something. Yeah, and, this is and our and first. I will, that's my last question because I, <laughs> I see my chairman standing up in the corner of my eye because I'm a little bit off topic in terms of budget. I agree with you. We've been looking into this um, in a number of ways um, for a number of years. Um, in the past, we've looked at a grow your own program even for our paraprofessionals to go into teaching, our MTAs to get licensed to, to teach here. But now we're really looking at our middle school students and encouraging them to think about education, but also our high school students coming back. So you're right, we've been exploring it on a, a number of different levels. This is our first year having um, brought together all of the different um, community organizations and the, the, um, college, the college presidents and provosts that, um, that Kathy had invited. So we're really in the preliminary stage, stages of talking with them and seeing how they can help us, help our students get into education and then return here. Um, okay. But in the past, we have done it on a number of different levels. Just we're really targeting um, as, as young as uh, middle school and continue to look at our, um, our future teachers club at the high school and maybe even moving that down to the middle school levels. I see. So at some point, you guys will put in place targets. Or yes, we will. Levels. Okay. Th thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, doctors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome, Council. You're learning my tricks. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very good. Councilor Azak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Superintendent. Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. And um, I was very lucky to attend last night's um, school committee meeting. And I have to tell you, every whenever I have attended, I not only am I proud of my children that have bought, brought me there, but I'm proud to see so many Brockton students uh, get awarded for their incredible achievements. And I, every year, it seems to we have huge numbers. And I think that that's just amazing. So I'm proud of all of our Brockton students. Um, I have a question regarding, I know that I've heard you bring up <coughs> numerous times the date of October 1st, students that have possibly gone outside of the district for school and then have come back to us. Mm -hmm. Now, I know we don't get funding for them. Do we ever get funding? Oh, no, we certainly get funding, but October 1st is when we report to the state for our next fiscal year, those are the numbers they use. So when I talked about growth from October 2nd right now to June 1st, I think I had a report of, what was the number, 225? We will not see that funding in this budget coming up this year. I will see it the next year if those students remain with us for October 1st when they are counted. And the numbers, I'm sorry, you said 225, is that I think it's 225, the growth that we have had other years. We've had larger growth between that October 1st and the June 1st. Do you remember back in 2010 when you had the, I believe, the earthquake in Haiti? I think the growth was really astronomical at the time, and we looked for relief. You know, again, we welcomed them. There's no place that you would rather have them be, and yet we looked for funding from the state, and it took... I mean, I think that happened in, was it, was it January that year? I believe so. And, you know, we didn't see funding again for, for quite some time. So, okay, I was just, I thought we did, never got the funding, so that's a, no, no, we definitely do. We count we them. Do. If they stay with us, that next October 1st, they will count. Very good. And the last question is, um, I've heard a lot about, of course, if you're considering cutting some classes. What happens to the time students who have picked that class what do they do? Is it a study hall? Is it just uh, unfortunately, what that's what it will have to be uh, directed academics at the high school, the middle school level, which is why right now, when we're just about finishing up our budget with city council with our school committee, we are so-called you know back across the street looking at rolling over the class sizes. You know, first grade becomes second, so we're looking district wide to make sure we're supporting elementary in a way. It's very different than your middle school and high school but there will be uh, some offerings that will not be available next year under this present budget. Thank I'm happy you. to come back uh, during the summer. 
when we have a better handle on time. I, I do want to, I want to leave by being able to say, you know, is there a ray of hope? You know, we're looking, again, at grants. We're looking at development. Title I monies will come in sometime in July. So these are things we're anticipating. Um, I'm happy to come back sometime during the summer before school opens and give you an update as to what it looks like in the Brockton Public School. It's probably not a bad idea for you to know because things could be very different when school opens on September 2nd for our students. I think that's a great idea. So uh, thank you again. Thank you, and thank you to the school committee. Thank you, Councilor. All set, Councilor? You set? Any other, uh, any other councilors that have any questions for the uh, superintendent of schools? I just want to go ahead, Council Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Superintendent, for being here tonight. Um, to tag along with what Councilor Cruz uh, was just saying, um, I know that we can't really, the only other venue is to basically increase taxes in the city to boost the um, revenue for the schools. And we know that that's probably not going to happen uh, beyond what we can afford to do. So what is preventing this system from tomorrow morning filing that lawsuit against the, uh, against the state? There's nothing preventing us. I think one of the things, as I said, we have been watching the Chapter 70. We were very hopeful that we would see some changes, and, and, and we could see some changes that make a difference. You know, we're just starting to hear Aldo Petronio attended a MASBO conference, what, about a week ago, Aldo? And we're starting to get a glimpse of some of the things that'll probably come out in this commission. We won't know that. I would rather wait to hear, you know, be prepared. But let's hear what they're saying about looking at Chapter 70 and what the recommendations are. Um, I think it'll allow us to put information together. When you hear me talk about an assault on urban education or an erosion on er what is happening with, with the funding for our students, let us put together that information, get the information from the Chapter 70 uh, Commission, and I think we'd like to invite other urban districts certainly to join us. Because I was here last year as my first budget and your first budget as mm -hmm. well, and uh, we had talked about this. Yeah. And with all due respect, it's not going to get any better. And I think no matter what they come back with, I don't think it's ever going to be at that level that you're looking at. And a lot of times I think we have to pre uh, be a little preemptive and, and, and go after them uh, with means that we do have. And you've got, um, you've got your school committee and you've got the city council here. And I'm sure the mayor will come along and you've got a strong body. And I think this is the right time to really strike because I think um, one, of the, one of the issues that I often uh, see happening in the city of Brockton is that we just sit back. We're not as, as, as proactive as we had been in the past with a lot of things that we do. And we just sit back and wait for other communities to act before we do the acting ourselves. So my recommendation to you, and, I, you know, and I'm sure my uh, fellow colleagues here will say the same thing, is, yeah, we can wait and see what the response is going to be. But those are months that are going to be coming by that this system is actually uh, hurting for funds uh, and children who are doing without. I was actually going to come uh, to the budget and actually suggest to you that we ought to do something with the foreign language classes. Uh, we had talked about this a while ago in terms of the need to uh, have Portuguese classes mm -hmm. taught at the various levels of the, uh, of the system, as well as French and some of these other languages that are productive languages in our community, you know, but we can't talk about that because we're talking about laying off teachers and um, uh, laying off school personnel and cutting back classes. So I think we're doing, you know, somewhat a disservice to the community by not, uh, you know, grabbing the bull by the horn and basically go after these folks like we should. Uh, in, in response to that, uh, Councillor, I, I certainly agree with you, but if you look back a year ago, one of the things that we did do immediately, I think the letter is dated June 25th, mm -hmm. we sent a letter to the Commissioner of Education. I think I sent one certainly to the City Council. We talked about the pothole funds. We talked about what we were facing as a city. I think one of the things that was very difficult was we didn't go up the 2.5% in taxes. And I thought for sure that the response back from the state was you also had a method you know, to bring some additional funding in. But that being said, I did get a response from the commissioner. There was conversation. We knew Chapter 70 Commission was out there meeting. And we made sure, again, that we were at every one of those meetings. 
So I don't disagree with you. I was hoping to get through your budget season right now. Um, school ends on June 26th, the half a day. How we did that this year is beyond me with the weather that we have. Uh, thank you to everybody that helped us. But the hope was sometime in July we would bring a group together and start to prepare and make sure that we were going forward with this. It certainly wasn't to hold back. And to answer about the language, when you hear me talk about the innovation grant that we got, the $75,000 innovation grant, we are very pleased. We're meeting actually, uh, the grant goes until the end of June. So we're meeting on Saturdays, Mondays, a group of teachers that are planning. The dual language program is French. It is Portuguese, and we're pleased with the materials, the supplies, and, and I see that happening within the next year or so. So we are starting to not only do that at an elementary level, but hoping to grow it so it continues into middle school and also to the high school. So even with uh, the funding deficits we have, we are trying to be innovative. Yeah, because I, um, I mean, I see it in terms of the other urban systems, uh, perhaps not being in the same situation that we're in, because if the Fall Rivers of the world or the New Bedford, New Bedford is of, the, of the world are hiring teachers when we're laying off mm -hmm. teachers, perhaps they're not in the same situation that we're in. So I think we need to be a little more proactive and use the resources that you, ha you have at your disposal mm -hmm. to help you fight this fight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, some of us that are you know, products, of, products of the school system, we're willing to roll up our sleeves and do the fighting if, if need be done. So I think this is the right time to do it. And, um, and I also, before I go, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the spelling bee that we had over at the uh, Little Red House this Saturday. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you one thing, I was one of the judges for, for the third grade class, and I, I, was, I was embarrassed, basically, because how bright these third grade kids were uh, spelling words that I had a real tough time spelling sometimes, you know. So, again, that goes to show you the, uh, the type of product that the school system is putting out there. And if we don't do what we need to do to fight this, uh, this un injustice that exists, I don't think we're doing uh, our kids a service. And I think, uh, you know, you ought to keep up the, the good work that you're doing and uh, count on us to help you fight the Thank fight. Thank you. Thank you for that support. And you, uh, I do want you to know that the school committee, again, is fully behind this, uh, you know, Vice Chair Tom Minicello, uh, Mayor Carpenter. <coughs> this was talked about last night at our school committee meeting. We again want to invite our city council, our legislative group, uh, community members. Uh, we certainly will put this together uh, ASAP. And when you talk about the spelling bee, you know, I want to thank everybody that put that together. Now, were you a moderator, a judge? Because one of the things, I had the eighth graders, and I have decided that what we need to do in the beginning, because th this is pretty emotional, you know, the little kids, I mean, this is a big deal. So I I've told my coordinators, et cetera, that we need to have a couple of rounds where everybody gets comfortable, like the words are a little bit easier. The <laughs> word, I had the eighth graders, and the word hypocrisy, <laughs> you know, it really took out a, a number of those students. But uh, like you, I'm very, very a lot impressed. Of, a lot of politicians <laughs> what was that? It takes a lot of politicians. I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> spelling it. <laughs> Very difficult. All set, Councilor Rodriguez. You're all set. All set. Councilor DiNapoli. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Superintendent. Uh, a question. If when we had the lawsuit back in 2010 or 2011, did our law department handle that, or did we get outside help? It's Jay, outside. do you do you re recall? Because I don't. All of them I can't there. remember next last week. <laughs> uh, the lawsuit was initially filed um, when Dukakis was governor, and uh, the initial uh, name on it was Webby. Webby. That's right. So I think that was like 1983 or 1984. There were a, success in, a succession of cases because the student graduated, so that by the time it was uh, Mo Hancock's kid, um, I think that case was probably decided around 1993. There exactly. were a series of expert outside firms that uh, represented the city in that, and there were some interested public uh, interest groups that joined us. So, um, and the result of that case was the Supreme Court uh, stayed any action <clears throat> because at the same time, because it was coming down, the decision was coming down, the uh, Democratic legislature and the Republican governor of the, at the time, Bill Weld, came together with this Education Reform Act and that was intended to be the solution to the problem which was being addressed by the case, which was that constitutionally a student 
from a poor community was not getting the same education as a student from a rich community because so much of the education was based upon the local property tax. And um, I think the word that was used in the Constitution by John Adams when he wrote it was that that obligation to educate every kid was to be cherished by the state. I see a whole lot of bacon and shaking, but I don't see a lot of cherishing going on in how the Commonwealth's funding education these days. But the problem is, to attack it again, you'd now have to go back to the original premise, I think, and decide how has the implementation, as the Education Reform Act is now a generation old, how has that implementation failed to meet its basic objectives? I think we all know where you can attack it. There's problems inside the formula, there's problems with the inflation, as Kathy said, but there's another problem, there's, a, there's an element in that uh, distribution everywhere which is legislative and alone, it's outside the foundation budget that was created back in 93 or 4. Every district, whether they're rich or not, that is above foundation is getting 25 bucks a student. It, it's a bribe to the rich districts to keep them in the game. And we're, we're gonna check to see how much that is across the state. But that money was never part of the education reform. It has nothing to do with the ability to pay or not pay. It has the ability to not need the money is basically what that's going towards. No, so it would take an outside firm again, take an expert an outside, firm, it, it, yeah, we, constitutional firm. And so we would have to appropriate yes. the, the money for that. Yeah, I think it was initially a, li a little bit of a school department appropriation, but I think there were public interest groups that thought the issue was so important that they helped to fund it. Okay, so we should look into that. I think so, too. Okay. But, but um, the point was raised a few minutes ago. If you're going to say to the state, you're not meeting your obligation to the city of Brockton, and I think you've got a case you can make, their first response is going to be, the Education Reform Act assumes that the city will appropriate its full levy each year when we calculate how much you must give to the school systems, the assumption is made that it's getting its share of that full levy appropriation. So when you leave two and a half million dollars out, about a quarter of that, or about one and a quarter million of that rather, really ought to be going into that budget and until you've put that in, at a minimum, until you've put that in, you have a hard time getting past that hurdle when you make an argument to the state because they're gonna say, look at your own house. So that means we'd have to have the levy at 2.5? You need, you need to raise, to be able to make the case right. that we're doing all we can right. and are still not able to fund syst the system adequately, I mm -hmm. think you'd need to be taxing at your levy capacity, and we're not. And we're not. And we're not, yeah. And that's a tough thing to do. Yeah, and the amount that we have to give when they say, what is your foundation budget every year, and what's the assumption as to what Brockton contributes out of its levy and what the state puts in for Chapter 70, the assumption is made that that money is there for the taking and therefore you're going to take it. I mean, the ex extra taxing capacity. Mm -hmm. And th therefore you're going to take it. They aren't considerate of the politics that maybe say, in this particular community, it's a hard decision to make to put that money into play. They don't care about that. That money is there under the law to be used and is not being used. So they assume you use it. So that means that if you're not going to use it, the assumption is it's going in. So to the extent that the school system is now made whole to what it's supposed to get out of the property tax levy, you, city of Brockton, will make that up elsewhere. But we're not doing that. Okay. I think you just confused a lot of people watching. <laughs> you need to raise taxes. <laughs> okay. <Th> <laughs> I don't think th that confuses anybody. Thank you. You need thank to you, raise Jay. taxes. Madam That's your Super problem. Attorney, thank you very much. And you know we you. you have the support of the entire council. Thank, thank you, you council. Very much. And he did not he did not confuse anyone. He didn't confuse me because sorry folks, but because I was there for twenty years and, and everything <laughs> he said was totally, totally exactly right. And the last gravy train we had was the Ed Reform Act of 1993. I think we got over $72 million into this city. It was a great gravy train, and, and we haven't been right since. So I'll hop on when, when you're ready, Superintendent. Thank you know you. that. You know where I stand on it. Councilor Bond, you had a follow-up? I did, yes. <clears throat> um, just about some of the future plans of the district. And there, there's been talk of the extended school day in, in some of the, um, the areas. And I just wanted to kind of find out how, or if you, if you can predict, how that would impact the budget going forward, negatively, positively? Well, it's extended learning time. We have seen, and I have our executive director principal, uh, June Saber Maguire here, and if you look at our Huntington School, which was our first turnaround school, right. she will tell you it is a success story, and it's not just her standing up here telling you all the wonderful things that have happened for those students. If you remember, though, even with the extended learning time monies that came in, I want to say about, what, $650,000? thousand dollars originally for 
and we had the school committee that supported another 300,000, which was cut last year. We have seen, again, narrowing of that achievement cap for those students. She probably will tell you she has close to 95 to 98% free and reduced lunch in that school. So again, that grant funding is, it, it's not totally in jeopardy. We anticipate getting that funding again for the Huntington School, although it could be at a reduced rate. I think we're waiting to see the end of the, the Senate budget hearings. I think they've actually put a group together from the House and the Senate to start to look at uh, some of the areas that they are not on the same page. Mm -hmm. We also, um, today we found out, um, our uh, Raymond School, which next year will be a K-5 to school, also approved going forward. The teachers approved going forward to apply for, which actually we've already applied for an extended learning time grant. It'll be a different pot of money. I don't anticipate as large an award, but it again will provide extra time to those youngsters and families. Okay. So we continue to try to position the district, as we said, with grants uh, for something that has been such a success in the district. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Council Bonds. Any other questions? Councilors for the uh, Superintendent of Schools, seeing as none, you're dismissed. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Superintendent. <laughs> we appreciate you being here. <laughs> Councilors, <laughs> Councilors just, before, um, just before you go, I just want to, uh, a couple of things I just want to remind you of. A Monday. Special City Council meeting at 7 o'clock p.m. right here in the council chambers. That's so we can take the items that came out of the ordinance committee and move them uh, forward so they can get to the third reading so we can act on them on June 22nd. And uh, I just want to remind you of that uh, as well. Um, the other thing uh, I want to just um, take time to, to thank as we wrap up our hearings, I want to thank our clerks, Anne Marie and Karen, for being with us throughout this whole process and all that they did. They did an outstanding job and they worked uh, very well uh, with me in the last few weeks and kept me on my toes as well. So I do appreciate everything they did. I also, I also do appreciate the mayor's office and Mr. Condon for all their work. They, um, when I met with them and I said I wanted the budget on a timely, timely note, they did, um, they did come through with that and, and here we are this evening and we're wrapping up, um, we're wrapping up with our hearings right now. And councilors, I want to thank you for your cooperation. Mr. Chairman, week. we also want to thank you for running a really professional budget hearing the last three nights. Appreciate it. As I said, um, at our finance meeting on June 15th, we will uh, talk the budget then. We'll make whatever deliberation we have to make, and then we'll move it forward to our final uh, wrap-up for uh, June 22nd, so we'll have a, a budget by the end of the fiscal year. So any other questions or concerns, counselors, that you may have this evening? Where are you taking us? Seeing none. <laughs> meeting adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>